interested in your island, it's got nothing to do with oil. I'm a paleontologist. What's all this archaic anatomy?
I present to you the top 10 weirdest looking dinosaurs. Uh, I want to state the obvious and tell you that I'm going to be butchering the names of these dinosaurs. Butchering the names of these dinosaurs. In 1856, the fossilized teeth of a small dinosaur were discovered in Montana. The species was aptly named Troodon, which means wounded teeth. When evolution passed out the stealth gene, Troodons lucked out. This drawer contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of Troodon. Troodon was every inch the predator, with razor sharp serrated teeth and large hook like claws. Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. Troodon may have posed a greater threat to mammals than any other predator on Earth. The Troodon was suddenly cut down in its prime. Dune. Well, hello, hello, everybody. And welcome back to Paleontologizing. Thank you for joining us. Happy Monday to everybody watching right now, live, or whatever time it may happen to be. Whether you're watching live right now, maybe from a different time zone than mine, or whether you're uh, watching in the future. Either on the VOD on Twitch, or maybe on YouTube. It's great to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. We're gonna have a fun stream. Now, if it's, uh, if it's anybody's very first time, then allow me to introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, as you could probably guess. Look at my office here. I work on dinosaurs. I dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the American West. Study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature. In fact, that's what I was working on this weekend. Excited to tell you about that. And uh, yeah, nowadays I talk about dinosaurs five days a week right here on Twitch. So uh, if you've got questions about dinosaurs, and honestly, who doesn't have questions about dinosaurs? Or about other subjects in natural history? Extinction, evolution, Maybe more broadly, questions about the philosophy of science itself. Whatever. Don't be shy with those questions. I'm here to answer them for you, and uh, we're going to be doing a great deal of that today. Because in among various dinosaur deep dives which occur and stuff like that, we're going to be taking a look at a YouTube video that I found the other day. One of these kind of clickbaity, you know, purport to be experts in science kind of deals it's there's a lot to unpack in it though i think it's gonna be a great springboard for discussion and uh we're gonna be dissecting it a bit you know and talking about the real science behind it because man i saw like maybe 30 seconds and there were a lot of <laughs> a lot of things that were stated in there which were not true so it should be fun it's gonna be kind of a low-key stream today pretty laid back but uh, I'm so glad you're here. And let me know if you've got any questions. Yeah. All right, before we get to our video, though, I'm going to scroll up to the top of chat, and I'm going to say hello to everybody. And we've had so many messages. I'm already missing the top of chat. It's already expired. But let me just go through real quick. Claire Burr, it's so good to have you back. 
Welcome, welcome, Claire. I feel like you were gone for a good while. We all missed you. I hope you're doing well. And Matt M33. Almost yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow, Matt M33. Yes, 28 months. Almost two years. Almost one year. Almost 28. I'm not a mathematician. But I am grateful for your support, Matt M33. Thank you for keeping me here on the air for the past 28 months. Through your financial support, your subscription there. You know, anybody can watch for free, but it takes a special kind of person to subscribe and thus support Science Outreach on Twitch, and I appreciate you for that, Matt. Thank you, thank you. Happy Monday. How are you doing? All right, Claire Burr is back. Claire Burr, was your, did your power go out or something? I was talking with Lordy. She hadn't seen you in a while, too. She thought maybe you had a power outage. She was a little bit worried. But uh, it's glad to, I'm glad to see you back. Back to Dinosaur Man. Dinosaur Man. <laughs> Kaya in the sky. Two months of Prime sub there from Kaya in the sky. Thank you, thank you for your support. That means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you, thank you, Kaya. Holy cow. Um, I hope all's well with you. I know you only get one of those primes per month. Thank you for spending it here. It means a great deal for me, you know? I know it doesn't cost you anything, but I get something out of that, and I... <laughs> that support is... It's wonderful, and I appreciate you, Kaya. Thank you very much. All right, go for Fluffer Nut is here too. How are you doing, Fluffer? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Smorphosaurus, howdy, howdy. Yeah, we got some new tunes. I wonder if you heard some of those. Uh, sounds like you did. Jody Fish heard one too. How are you doing, Jody Fish? Welcome, welcome. And Marie K. Author, how are you doing? I hope all is well. And we were just talking about the movie King Kong last week. Look at this. Ooh. Holy cow, clearly. Thank you for the 12 months of support. Thank you very much for the one. Really appreciate that clearly. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Cyan Streams. You make me blush. Blint, I hope you had a great weekend. Hope you and Lita and the baby and the cats are all doing well. Um, thank you, thank you, Blint, for those 100 bits. Yeah. You'd be proud of me, Balint. I worked on my manuscript for, like, all of Saturday, my Spinosaur manuscript. It's getting there. It's getting there. And Parker Zilla, thank you for the 300 bits. Wow, I really appreciate your generosity there. Thank you for your support. That means a lot to me. It does. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, who else we got? Rob Suey. How's it going, Rob Suey? Welcome, welcome. Give them Nell. Glad you're back, Nell. It's good to see you. Uh, who else have we got? Golganek. Ah. Uh, uh, and Golganek. Did you have a power outage too? Shoot, Golganek. I'm sorry to hear that, but I hope you're doing well. Always lovely to see you, Golganek. And Cephalon Wolf. Uh, asked, what's the difference between a poorly dressed man on a tricycle and a well dressed man on a bicycle? With a tire. And gratitude. You go, Thank you very much for the one <laughs> And thank you for those bits, Travel the World. I did have a good weekend. I had a very good weekend, Travel. Thank you for asking. I hope you did too. And you know what, Travel? I just installed the new nozzle on the 3D printer. Um, we're going to give that a spin today. I've got a good feeling about it. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for your ongoing support, Travel. It really does mean a lot to me. Uh, Smorphosaurus, what's shaking with you? Great to see you, Smorph. Procyon MFC, how you doing, Procyon? Uh, Hike the Earth, howdy, howdy. Glad you could make it. And Eddie Scarin, how are you doing, Eddie Scarin? What's shaking? Uh, uh, who else do we have got? Vampyr says, hey, everyone. Hey to you, Vampyr. Welcome, welcome. Blinkster says, I am ready. I'm glad you are. I am too. It's good to have you here. Uh, MS Coggins, how are you doing? Happy Monday to you. Hope you're having a good day so far. Um, and you worked 53 plus hours last night? There's not even that many hours in a night, Lenina. You're bending space and time, evidently. And that's amazing. <laughs> Holy cow, I hope you're resting, Lenina. Uh, just finished day 8 out of 12 of work. I'm... What's that emote? 
I'm a sword and a stone. Oh, that's a skull. Ooh. Lenina, I hope you're resting. It's it's good to see you, Lenina. Uh, welcome back, by the way. We missed you during your business trip. I'm glad you've uh, glad you've returned. Um, I hope it was fun. Well, as much as work can be fun. Uh, let's see who else we got. Space Isaac. Hey, hey, hey to you, Space Isaac. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, Mitch Biocannon. How are you doing? Welcome back. Yeah. And, uh... Let's see. Who else do we have here? Undisclosed Space Frog. Uh, making my way down through chat, trying to say hello to everybody. Don't want to miss anyone, but... I'll probably miss somebody. Gianmi, I'm not missing you. I'm glad you're here. Welcome, Gianmi. Uh... And progress on Baryonyx was made well, I hope. It was Jody Fish, yes indeed. Holy cow. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I can't discuss much of it right now, but, uh, you know, it's now in the hands of my co-author who's going to be making some revisions and additions. I just have a few more bits of text that I might want to alter and maybe write some figure captions and then make the figures. Still have to do the illustrations for it. But... Yeah, I'm going to have this thing submitted before I leave for the summer, which is going to be awesome. Uh, who else do we have? Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Mayor Space, how are you doing? Uh, and Mayor Spaces, how are they going to make se two seasons of Prehistoric Planet? They're going to run out of prehistory to talk about soon. Yeah, maybe after part 20,000, they'll start to uh, run out of stuff to cover. But holy cow. As far as I can tell, they're still sticking to the latest Cretaceous with Season 2 of Prehistoric Planet. So yeah, yeah. You could have a hundred times as much Prehistoric Planet and still not run out of stuff. Run out of interesting dinosaur fauna to talk about and things like that. Parkerzilla! Thank you again for those 300 bits. I appreciate it, Parkerzilla. Yeah. And Vigilanta! Executive function went yes indeed, Vigilanta. Welcome back. I hope you're doing well. It's good to see you. Yeah. Uh, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Nerf Dermer. How are you doing? I dig those cardboard cowboy emotes. Wonderful. Yeah. And Eddie Scarn says, what do you think about David Peter? Oh, boy. Don't get me started. Yeah. Well, you know, every field has its cranks, I suppose. And, uh, yeah. Anyway. Trying to keep some relatively positive vibes on today's stream, Eddie Scarring. <laughs> so I won't be discussing that topic at length. Ashara Dell, chilling in the background there. How you doing, Ashara Dell? Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you. Atreus says, hey, Danny in chat. Hey, Atreus. How are you? Almost to the bottom of chat now. Juju Voodoo. How are you doing? Welcome back, Juju. Uh... Oh, and Juju says, I love your Iguanodon statue behind you. That was my favorite going up. Thank you. Yeah, I 3D printed that. That's the uh, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins uh, conception of Iguanodon from so long ago during the Victorian times, you know, circa 1850. Um, I'm actually working on a replacement for that so that I don't have to keep saying, hey, the ignore that. It's wrong. That's... <laughs> Um, I'm working on a replacement. I can show you. Uh, it's based on a dinosaur. There we go. Yeah. Based on one of my very favorite dinosaurs, a Mononychine theropod. This is an illustration of Mononychus. Um, there's another dinosaur that's, that I helped work on called Trirarchuncus which is the last one of these guys. It's like Mononychus, but kind of turned up to 11, probably, given Cope's rule and all that stuff. We don't have very much of it, but it should look a little something like this. Um, here we go. Jurachuncus. Feathers. Here is my rendition of the critter so far. I have feathers all over it. One of those big, ridiculous claws. I really wanted to exaggerate the claws a little bit. But anyway, I sculpted this live on stream last week. And uh, it's not done yet. I still have to finish the feathers and the face. I'm going to pose it. 
and then print it. And it's going to go right up there where the uh, Iguanodon is now. So yeah, yeah. Perfectly spherical tree run. There you go, Clairbur, yeah, yeah. No, it should be it should be nice when it's done. I'll be able to point to that and go, yeah, that's my dinosaur. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jack Wilson on my crew in 2015 found the claw of this critter so well preserved. Probably the best Alvarosaur claw preserved anywhere in the world. Most complete. And uh, that's what allowed us to finally name this animal. We'd had bits and pieces of it floating around since the 1980s. Like, we'd known that this kind of animal was there in the Hell Creek Formation. We didn't really have enough material to give it a name. Um, yeah. Until summer of 2020. Uh, there's the illustration on Wikipedia. Trirarcuncus. Yeah, the very last of the Alvarezsaurs. Um, yep, anyway. Pretty cool critter. And there we go. There's my name on the author list. <laughs> um, True Arconcus. Cool animal. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And Oscar Jr.'s thank you, Oscar. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh... And Mayor Space says it would be cool to print out a real Iguanodon at the same scale as the Waterhouse Hawkins Iguanodon. I thought about doing that originally, Mayor Space. In fact, I might do that after this next summer because I'm going to be... Uh, well, the plan is I'm going to be working with the Utah Geological Survey. And we'll be digging up some more Iguanodont bones out there in eastern Utah, uh, which might well turn out to be a new species or new genus of Iguanodontian. Um, so, yeah, it'd be very cool to have uh, like a, an accurate iguanodontian up there so I could point to it and go, yeah, this is kind of what this animal would actually look like. And we were digging up a new, you know, entirely new taxon of iguanodontian. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's the, that's like an 1850s rendition of what this animal would look like based on very limited material. This is a much better idea. Field is narrow to what we understand. Uh oh. On the contrary, we stretch our understanding to try and take in the universe. Panda lover, thank you for the follow and welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of our modern perception of what this animal would look like. Yeah. Um, yeah, facultatively bipedal, so it could probably walk on two legs or four legs, depending on how it's feeling. I'm here to applaud Big, uh, Spikes on the thumbs. And Chai Latte Nebula, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Good to have you here. Yeah. Good stuff. But yeah. Yeah. Still need Truarcuncus lawn ornaments? That would be cool, Goganek. That would be really cool. Maybe someday, if I could work with a fabrication company or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um. And, uh... GSV Sleeper Service, how are you doing? Cite them right? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Just gotta cite your sources. Yeah. And, uh... Panda Lover says, Hi, I'm Steffi. The stream looks interesting. Thank you, Steffi. Appreciate that. Um, and you've got ADHD? Cool. Some of my people closest to me also have ADHD. Uh... Yeah. I'm glad you're here. Let me know if you've got any questions about dinosaurs, about the fossil record, about extinction or evolution or any of that good stuff. As a paleontologist, I work on dinosaurs, I dig them up, I study them, and, uh, and I answer your questions about them live five days a week. So let me know if you've got any questions. Yeah. And Juju says, I love Iguanodon on Walking with Dinosaurs. Yeah, very cool critter. Very cool critter. Uh, and Vigilanta... I also use Zotero, absolutely. Yeah, it's great for keeping track of references. And, um, I just wish, I still need to figure out how to export them properly because I had so many issues when I tried to do that with an abstract, uh, what was it, a month or two ago? Oh boy, yeah. Anyway, great to have everybody here.
Thank you, Blankster, for the hydrate. Now, there's not a great deal of fossil news to discuss today. I figured, in my various browsings and stumblings upon different things this weekend, you know, I, I happened across a, uh, a YouTube video from an up-and-coming channel called Space Matters. Or maybe Space Matters? Anyway. Um, yeah. Just posted two weeks ago, and it's entitled, What Happened with Dinosaurs During the Cretaceous Period? Which is a, a huge question. I mean, holy cow. We're gonna see if this video kind of... Well, yeah. This is a huge topic. It's a long video. 30 minutes. I'm just a few seconds short, actually, of 31 minutes long. We're gonna be looking at this video, and, uh... You know, I thought about creating, like, a counter that would show up on the screen, so, like, every time they get something wrong, I'd push a button and it'd go, like, ding, and it would add to the counter. Like, an inaccuracies tally. But I thought, you know, I don't... That's not really the vibe that we should be going for here. You know? I think sometimes... There can be kind of a... You know, even among, like, professional science communicators, sometimes there can be kind of a... A very negative, sneering kind of, like, Well, that isn't accurate. Like... Like, ew, gross. This is, uh... I don't know if that's always productive, you know? We're gonna watch this video. We're gonna use it as a springboard for discussion about real fossil science. This is supposed to be fun, you know? So we're gonna try and keep this mostly positive and mostly upbeat. And even if something really bothers me, I'm gonna smile through it. But it is gonna be fun. And I, uh... Hope you're excited. Oh, yeah. You know exactly? Oh, yeah, Vigilante. Yeah. Yeah. I... It is never my intention here on Paleontologizing to go like, mm, Well, actually, this will be this way because... Mm, that I don't think that's... Sometimes people who are already interested in science find that amusing, and they can relate to that, but your average person you know, is going to be put off by that. And I feel like sometimes we in the sciences forget this. So yeah, we're going to be looking at this kind of clickbaity video. And, uh, which uses a lot of stock footage. They might have a synthetic voice or something too. I don't really remember. I found this a couple days ago. But, uh, anyway. Oh, and we had a dinosaur deep dive redeem. Well, shoot, we'll do that first, Lenina. Thank you. I'm sorry. Claire Burr has requested a dinosaur deep dive. And I think we even have a clip of this critter. Yeah. I've heard other people say that this is perhaps the cutest, one of the cutest of all dinosaurs. And that makes me really happy because I think little ornithopods like this often don't get nearly enough attention. So let's take a look at this critter real quick. Called Zalmoxes. This is a really small little rhabdodontian dinosaur. A little beaky two-legged plant eater from uh, the latest Cretaceous of Romania, I want to say. Like Transylvania? Yeah... I, it's not a heterodontosaurid, Claire Byrne, no. It's a, uh... Well, you'll see. And... Let's make sure our sound is on. Here we go. Zalmoxies. Yeah. Wait, is it? 
Are Raptodontians descended from heterodontosaurs? We'll have to look this up. They could be. Anyway, take a look. They're very cute. Aww. Anyway, yeah, they're uh they're very very cute and I mm. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> If you haven't seen Prehistoric Planet before, then uh, you probably don't realize I have to pause before it gets to a certain point. Oh. Yeah. Look at the little guys. Run, run, run. <laughs> And then somebody does try to eat them, so, yeah. Anyway, I won't show you that, because... It almost seems disrespectful. Dalmoxies. There we go. Uh, Rhabdodontid ornithopod dinosaur? Yeah, so heterodontosaurs I don't think were ornithopods. I think they're like basal ornithischians. But anyway, yeah. Uh... Complicated history there. First known as Moclodon, then called Rhabdodon robustum, and then, uh, yeah, named Zelmoxis robustus after that, given its own genus. Yeah, pretty cool. And look at that skull. It's got like a, oh man, the skull is so simple it almost looks sculpted. Like, it'd be nice if we actually had a better preserved skull than that. I bet you the original is all squat flat. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Very cool. And let's see here. Whew. Excuse me. Yeah, maybe about eight feet long, full grown. Uh, we don't have very much material from it. But yeah. So these guys are little ornithopods. Here's some kind of speculative reconstructions that show them with feather-like filaments on them, which they may or may not have had. We're not totally sure yet. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, sculpted by evolution, says Kalik. How you doing, Kalik? Now, I think this one might have been largely sculpted by people. Like, I don't know. It reminds me of, like, the, the skeletal mounts of, like, Crichtonsaurus that I've seen, where they're almost entirely sculpted. There's not a lot of original material in there. Uh, it looks like there might be some brain case stuff. Ontogeny. But yeah, yeah. But yeah. Feather like filaments be a soundbite like ontogeny, Vigilante. Find me a clip of somebody saying the phrase feather like filaments, and maybe we could make that happen. You know? Can't be me, though. It'd have to be another paleontologist. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, pretty cool critter, Zalmoxis. Uh, so this dinosaur actually suffers from what a lot of European dinosaur taxa suffer from, which is a lack of material. Europe, well, at the time, you know, looked very different from how it does today. Let's go to, say, 66 million years ago. At the time... Right before the asteroid struck Earth, and I guess shortly afterward, too, for actually a good while afterward, this is what Europe looked like. It's kind of an archipelago of islands in kind of a shallow tropical sea like this. And uh, lots of weird stuff would happen with dinosaur body size and that kind of thing. You'd get, like, isolated populations of dinosaurs, and big dinosaurs would shrink, and small dinosaurs would get larger, and, you know... Island gigantism and island dwarfism would be happening left and right uh, throughout here. Really interesting time in Earth history to be a critter in what is today Europe. So yeah, Zelmox is, is from Eastern Europe over here. I actually can't... 
I used to be able to like name every country in Europe just by its silhouette. I forget where Romania is. I want to say it's over here. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. But as a result of Europe today being largely covered by either buildings or forests or you know sometimes roads and just like mountains and stuff too. There's not a great deal of like exposed Badlands style sedimentary rock in which to prospect for dinosaurs in. And so while there are lots of dinosaur fossils from Europe, they tend to be more rare than they are in places like the American West or uh, the Patagonia region of South America, or the Gobi Desert of Mongolia and China. Um, you just don't have as many, as much outcrop for finding these animals, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, scoured by glaciers in some cases. Yeah, yes, indeed, Clarebury, yeah. Yeah, northern Europe, certainly. Uh, northeast coast of England. There you go, Vigilante, yeah. Yeah. There are... I don't know about the northeast coast, but the south coast of England. Around Lyme Regis. Also, out near the, the Isle of Wight. Areas like that, there are a lot of Mesozoic-era... Uh, rocks exposed, usually on the shoreline. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Northern English accent, Vigilante. <laughs> Northern English accent is... Do people think that's grating? I don't. I think, yeah. Northern English accent can be lovely. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Nell says there's a bone bed from the late Triassic. Memory. Where is that, Nell? I'd love to know. And Scotland is very rugged. Yes, indeed, Neil. There are... There have been a number of fossil finds reported from Scotland in recent years. Including a, uh... Where, where was Jark from? Let's look this up real quick. Um... Jark. There we go. Yeah. In the Middle Jurassic Lilt Shale Formation of Scotland. Yes, indeed. So these are pterosaurs. Uh, flying reptiles that lived alongside the dinosaurs. Yeah. Something got pretty big, which is cool. Oh, and you're in Cardiff. Oh, very cool now. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And X Mariner says we're going to a They Might Be Giants concert tomorrow. Very cool, X Mariner. They have a song called I'm a Paleontologist. Really? Wow. Who would have thought that such a song could exist? Um. <laughs> uh, it's not like. Uh, not like I've played that song a million times before. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. And you see Jark in there? Very nice paleo stream, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jark, I think, is the big... Uh, no, these are... Uh, never mind. These are different wingspan estimates for Jark. And I hope I'm s s pronouncing that correctly. Uh, it is Gaelic that the name is derived from, correct? Jark. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's Scottish Gaelic. Yes, indeed. Uh... <laughs> Uh, uh, what a name. Excellent stuff. Yeah. But yeah, anywho. Cool critter. Cool critter. Um. And no, Oliver, it's not like the Lumberjack song from Monty Python. <laughs> yeah. Um, X Mariner, at, I know that song well. The I'm a Paleontologist song. Uh, when we do ukulele time. You know, after a, say, a level 5 hype train. I usually play that song as it's kind of my warm up after the warm up. 
Yeah. Classic song. Um, they might be trying to... They've got a bunch of, uh, of good science songs. And uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And Sparhawk got a long message here. Let's see. Uh, made your gaming bar earlier. I'm thinking of nominating you to be on the main screens to 400 pub goers. That sounds like a big pub there, Sparhawk. Holy cow. How would I feel about that in the future? It'd be lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much to the 100 bits. Thank you, X Mariner, for those 100 bits. Really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if I was to nominate you for the main screens one evening, people might even get a thrill of watching a real life paleontologist. If not, that is cool. Well, I appreciate you asking permission, and I say go for it, Sparhawk. I'm flattered that you would think of me. Holy cow. And if people wanted to, you know. I guess if you're at a pub, you might still have your phone with you. If people want to type in questions or something, I'd be more than happy to interface with them. You know, say hello to all the good pub goers and answer their questions about, uh, about fossils, dinosaurs in particular, since that's my wheelhouse of, uh, of research. Yeah. Um, appreciate you asking, Sparhawk. Yeah. Yeah. Uh,. Iconic song. What an iconic song right there. Holy cow. Thank you, iconic song, for the four months of support. I really appreciate that. It's almost a third of a year, isn't it? <laughs> See, it's not funny if I get it right. Um, anyway, iconic song. Thank you for keeping me here online for the past four months. I really appreciate your support. It really does mean a lot to me. You're making a difference for science outreach, so I appreciate you. Uh, Kalex says, uh, We get 13 different Patagonian dinosaurs coming to my local museum in a couple weeks. Very cool. I think, did I see an advertisement for that somewhere on Twitter? Not an advertisement, advertisement. Um, yeah. Honestly, the only Twitter ads I've seen recently have been like, Instagram scam products and stuff. It's been really lousy. No, this is like, uh, I saw like a flyer that somebody posted for it, maybe. Um, but very cool. Might also run into Dinosaur Dave as well. Very neat, Kalek. Very, very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And, uh, and building a bookcase. Very nice now. That could be quite the undertaking. I remember building these. That was, uh, was quite the endeavor. I thought I'd get them done in, like, a couple hours. Nope. Longer than that. I almost ended up missing stream that time. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Ragnarokker says, How accurate is the Jurassic World Quetzalcoatlus? Uh, oh, boy. So, I'm... Here, I should preface this by saying that I'm not a pterosaur worker. I don't work on pterosaurs. I think the Quetzalcoatlus in Jurassic World is way too big. Like, way too big. It was, like, as big as an airplane. Like a... Like an old Soviet cargo airplane. Um, let's see. There we go. You know, if this isn't a rep... If this is a, a representation of what it looked like in the film, that's not the worst. It's really not the worst. I've seen, I've certainly seen worse than that. Um, yeah. It's definitely not that big, though. Holy cow. <laughs> ah, yeah. Yeah, so there we go. You know, this, this will give you a pretty decent idea. So it's this big in the movie between the gray and the brown. This is how big it would actually be in life between the green and the blue. So yeah, it's way too big for one. And they probably make it too thick too. A lot of Jurassic World dinosaurs are kind of too beefy. Like, I don't know. A pterosaur like this. I don't know. At least it's a big improvement over this. 
from uh, 1993. But back then, we didn't know all that much about these animals anyway, so... I don't know. Maybe you could make up some kind of excuse for them. But, uh... Anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's too big. Too big. Like, way too big. <laughs> These were big animals, though. So the biggest animals that ever flew were these big ass darked pterosaurs like this. Or at least we think as darked pterosaurs are probably the biggest of the pterosaurs. That's life size, by the way. That's, you know, that's proportional to that man there. Uh, these are big animals, you know, like as tall as a giraffe. Pretty cool. There's the one at the Field Museum. That, uh... There were two of these life-size models that I encountered last summer. And, uh, and streamed next to. They're, uh, they're very cool critters. They really are. So anyway. Yeah. It's, um, but they're, they were definitely way too big in the, in the Jurassic World Dominion movie. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It sent me a little comparison on Twitter. Thank you, PaleoStream. Well, let's take a look at that. By the way, I still, I realize I still need to respond to your message on Twitter there, PaleoStream. I spent a, maybe the majority of my weekend working on this Spinosaur manuscript that I'm trying to finally get published. And, uh, but yeah. Well, there you go. Okay, nice, PaleoStream. And is that Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach as a uh, scale there? So yeah, legit Quetzalcoatlus and Jurassic World Quetzalcoatlus. It's like twice as big almost. Um, very nice, Paleo Stream. Very nice. Yeah. By the way, if anybody's not yet following Paleo Stream, holy cow, are you missing out? If you're interested in paleo art and reconstructing extinct animals, figuring out what they looked like, Applying artistic flair to them, you know, and just having a chill good time talking about fossil critters. Go follow Paleo Stream and do it right now. Don't miss. Uh, don't miss that opportunity. We've got a very accomplished paleo artist who streams here on Twitch on Fridays, I believe. Uh, so anyway, go click on Paleo Stream's channel, check the schedule, and go follow. So yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Embiginator, there you go, Ragnarokker, yeah. As for the, uh, the pterosaurs, the pteranodon, and, um, are they still pteranodon? They're not Geosternbergia, they're pteranodon, yeah. Pteranodon ingens. From, uh, Jurassic Park 3. Uh, it is really ridiculous that they have teeth, for one thing. Yeah. Um. I also think that the, uh, the... You know, I'm not too clear on how the, the forelimbs work on these guys. But this might not be correct. Yeah. And they also probably could not grasp like that with their feet. Their feet weren't built that way. You know, these are not like birds of prey. Also, it would not be able to carry them away like that, too. That's too heavy. We mammals are dense. These guys are all full of air, you know? So anyway, yeah. But the fact that they have teeth, which you see... Where was that? I think it's right... Right here in this shot. And it's all mixed so dark. Do we see the teeth there? Oh, it doesn't open its mouth. Uh, anyway. Yeah. I honestly think that the, uh, the depiction in... In the Lost World is a little bit better. Um... Yeah... These guys here. They also have the grasping feet, which... These are seagoing pterosaurs. They weren't adapted for perching like this. They didn't have perching feet. 
But look at that toothless beak right there. The very name Pteranodon means wings with no teeth. Pteranodon. Wing, no teeth. Pteranodon. So having them without teeth. Yeah. That's the way it should be. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And Paleostrum says, that's indeed Stromer, my preferred scale figure. That's awesome. Paleostrum, yeah. Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach, uh, esteemed early German paleontologist. And man, that guy have a tragic story. He really suffered under the Nazi regime because he himself was an ardent anti-Nazi. Um... Yeah, since he was basically, like, a minor member of the aristocracy, they couldn't just kill him, really. But, anyway, they sent his sons off to fight and die on the Eastern Front, and they persecuted him for his research, and, yeah. Anyway, we'll talk about that in detail another time when we talk about the story of Spinosaurus. But, um, it's so cool to see Stromer honored like that as a scale bar in, uh, and your wonderful illustrations, Paley Stream. That's makes me smile. It really does. Yeah. Uh yeah. And Paleo Stream says we had a forgotten bloodline stream last weekend. Very cool, Paleo Stream. We finally got around to uh, watching the trailer for Forgotten Bloodlines. Uh on Friday. In fact, we should do that again real quick. Because I feel like I've not done a good enough job. Of, uh... There we go. Uh, Kickstarter trailer. I did make a contribution to this. What was it? $45, I think? Um, it's what I could afford. But, uh... Anyway. I know we talk all about dinosaurs on this channel, because, of course, that's what I work on, that's what I study. That's what I dig up. I'm a dinosaur guy. But, you know, we can't always neglect our Cenozoic mammals. And so, uh, take a look at this. This is basically this uh, crowdfunded project called Forgotten Bloodlines. This, the intention here is to basically be like a Miocene age prehistoric planet. Like a nature documentary style show about Miocene mammals like entelodonts and calicotheres. Take a look. 20 million years ago, the beginning of the Miocene Epoch. Very cool. Although seemingly familiar, this is a world of wonder, mystery, and danger. Uh-oh. <laughs> Very cool. Tiny rhinos, the size of dogs. The little rhinos. Bizarre, horse like giants. I love calicotheres. Instead of hooves. And a pig like behemoth with jaws that could crush bone. Very a world cool. Forgotten to time, never seen by the eyes of man until now. Very neat. I'm actually really impressed that they got Nigel this Marvin the for this. Incredible story of two of America's most astounding bygone beasts. Yeah, very cool. Is that Meropus? Step Which back genus? Into an ancient world, forgotten bloodlines agate. Please Which, uh, us on Kickstarter now. Live. Which Calicothere genus is that? Paleostream. Um, anyway, very, very cool. I'll give you the link to this right here. And, uh, you can find... You can find the, uh, the Kickstarter link in there, too. In fact, why don't I just give that to you? We'll make this as frictionless as possible. There we go. I already made a contribution to this live on stream on Friday, I think. But, uh, yeah, very, very cool. Um, holy moly, is this the same trip? Beginning? Looks like it is. I think they also have another clip right here. Oh, Kickstarter trailer. 
An official opening scene. Well, let's have ourselves a look at that. Yeah. This is Agate Springs, 20 million years ago, the beginning of the Miocene epoch. Is that Agate Springs, Savannah, Nebraska? Yeah, one day Nebraska. From the badlands of Nebraska. Very cool. Not long ago, these plains were lush and heavily forested, nurtured by volcanic ash spread by wind and rain. But as the global climate begins to shift, conditions are becoming increasingly arid. This brings hardship for the native fauna. Ooh. And the conflict it's inherent the to drama. The dry season and a small group of Stenomylus gather around what remains of a rapidly shrinking watering hole. Uh-oh. Despite appearing similar to antelope, the lanky herbivores are actually an early form of camel. Yep. Camels first evolved here in North America. I man, when I was visiting um bunch of different zoos uh in summer of 2022 you know in june and july of 2022 we did what th two or three or four different zoo streams uh every time i encountered camels i always made sure to point out to chat camels first evolved here in north america that's where camels are from today not many people associate north america with camels but nope camels are a north american original you might think of them as being, you know, from Africa or Mongolia um, or South America in the form of uh, guanacos and vicuñas, llamas and alpacas. But indeed, camels originally evolved in North America. Watering hole. Yeah. Despite appearing similar to antelope, the lanky herbivores are actually an early form of camel. Yeah, very These cool. relict puddles provide a lifeline for all manner of animals. Mega Vigilithia. This also makes them an ideal hunting ground for predators. Ooh. Deodon, one of the few animals that benefits from the harsh conditions of the dry spell. This oh, individual yeah. is a young male, only having recently left the care of his mother. But he's already a formidable hunter. What a ridiculous animal, by the way. So I, man, I remember showing this, showing Antilodonts to Twitch chat maybe like a year ago, and people kept saying, oh yeah, it looks like this creature from uh, from Lord of the Rings. I, I don't remember what it was called, but people were quite insistent on that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, people are saying Warg. Okay. Warg, who's not the Klingon character from Star Trek. That's Worf. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Nor is it a tar... What's it... Oh, We're not going to get all hung up on pop culture stuff right now. Anyway, I just want to point out what a rid ridiculously weird animal this is. So they are related to pigs. They sometimes get referred to as hell pigs. And I think I might have a, um... Is it here? Right. Well, shoot, there's one on the, uh... The back cover of Cruising the Fossil Freeway with art by Ray Troll. Right here. There we go. But he's got a lovely, like, folk art style illustration. Uh, let's see, it would look really good on, like, the back of a motorcycle jacket or something. Hell pigs. Uh, these guys aren't, strictly speaking, pigs per se, but they are related to even toad ungulates like that, especially pigs. I think pigs might be their closest living relatives, although I could very well be wrong about that. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Ha ha ha! Yeah. Here is... And take a look at that. I think this is supposed to be Entelodon, which is a kind of Entelodont. 
There's one next to some... You went to Thiers or Bronte Thiers? And, uh... There we go. Archaeotherium. Which na whose name means Ancient Beast. Hell Pig. Archaeotherium. That'd look great as a patch on the back of a motorcycle jacket. It really would. You know? That'd be a great name for a motorcycle gang. Yeah. We're the Hell Pigs out of Bakersfield. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And should be Archaeotherium, says Paleo Scream. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. But yeah. And Darth Goof says their closest living relatives are, are hippos. I guess that makes sense. Hippos are also, um. Even toed ungulates. Um. Artiodactyls. Right? Yeah. Hippos got four toes. Um. But really, are they thought to be more closely related to hippos now than to uh, to pigs? Interesting. Hippo pig wolf, says Claire Burr. Yeah, such weird critters. They are really, really neat. Yeah. And just... Look at the shape of this critter, too. I'm always astonished by how spindly their little legs look. Not little legs. They're still long legs, but they're just this huge hulking mass supported by these little legs. Kind of reminds me of, like, Pronghorn, you know, genus Antila Capra, uh, who have been referred to as, like, sausages on stilts. Kind of reminds me of this guy, too, you know? Uh, and hippos and whales are their closest relatives. Changed some time ago. Thank you, Paleostream. See? I'm not a mammal guy. You know, all this dinosaur stuff is just... I haven't been keeping up with, uh... You know, with my, uh, Cenozoic mammal taxonomy. Oh. But he's already a formidable hunter. Look at that. Beautiful work here. Weaker Holy cow. Heat and focused on water, the Stenomylus should be easy prey. Uh-oh. If he can catch one, that is. Hmm. Man, what a nightmarish creature. There's just something deeply unsettling about that. Just, I don't know, something about this animal is... This gives me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. But it seems even a weakened camel can outrun a Deodon in a straight chase. Yeah, you got Only those little spindly legs. Every ten hunts is likely to be successful. Uh, His hunger will drive him to... Hopefully... One out of one Kickstarters here will be successful. That's partly up to you, chat, if you'd like to contribute to this project. Yeah. Try again. And an animal of his size must feed soon. Hmm. I feel like I should play that, that Sarah McLaughlin song right here. You know? Um. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> oh, the There we go. distraction. <laughs> oh, beautiful release. Memories seep through my veins. For just a few dollars, you can be a hero for these Miocene mammals. And maybe I'll find some peace tonight. Uh, extinction doesn't have to be the end. In the arms of the angel, fly away <laughs> from here. Anyway, I'll give you the Kickstarter again. Um, what a cool project. There we go. And the endlessness that she There we go. You You can help this Antilodont live again with a small donation. <laughs> uh anyway. Um very, very cool stuff. And uh a nightbot command for that? Uh, we'll see, Claire. We'll see. I've got so many Nightbot commands nowadays. But, uh... 
Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Let me think about that. I'll see how the Kickstarter is doing and everything. If I feel like they really, really need some more attention, I'll do my best to get it. But yeah. And Juju Voodoo says, have you seen the YouTube channel Nature's Compendium? Uh, I don't know if I've ever actually watched any of their videos, but Nature's Compendium hangs out here in chat, Juju Voodoo. Yeah. Um, yeah, they seem cool. Uh, they're always asking good questions and stuff, and uh, they're a cool part of this community. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Lenina. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. So anyway. Turn the sound on. Do we have narration here? Yeah. Follow our pre-launch page on Kickstarter. Very, very cool. Yeah. Really neat. So yeah. Yeah. Now, from that, we're going to jump into something which is going to be far less, uh, shall we say, put together, well-researched, accurate. This is exquisite. I mean, holy cow. Just incredible. It, like, it, it really doesn't get much better than this. Yeah, holy cow. We're going to jump from that into... A kind of random, semi-clickbaity video on dinosaurs. And again, the point of this is not to be all sneering and go, Well, actually, this is inaccurate. Rawr, rawr, rawr. That's not our intention here. Our intention here is to use this as a jumping-off point for talking about dinosaurs of the Cretaceous. And uh, I'm not going to be holding a, a, a tally of you know, the number of inaccuracies or anything like that. It's cool that somebody put effort into making this video here from this channel called Space Matters. Um, but yeah, yeah. Sometimes as somebody who does science outreach full-time, I think it's important to kind of, you know, keep my finger on the pulse of uh, dinosaur science content in places like YouTube. This is a means of doing that. Jurassic Gaming? Holy cow. I just realized my volume is way too low, too. That's why everything sounded so quiet. Jurassic Gaming, thank you so much. has a new sound for their three listeners. Really appreciate that, Jurassic Gaming. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? I hope things are good. Welcome, Raiders. Let me know if you've got any questions. All right, without further ado, let's jump into this, you know? Yeah. Uh, good stuff. The Cretaceous period. Was Whoop. And, uh, A.K. A. Durrani says, I've been doing a lot of reading on prehistoric camel species. Very cool, K. Durrani. Wait, were you, did you just come in with the raid? Because we were just talking about ancient camels. Right here. I mean, shoot, here's some of them. Yeah. Oh, that's so much louder now. Shoot. Run, camels, run. Uh, you just came in? Are you are you aware of this? Hey, K. Durrani? This is a documentary that's seeking funding right now. Can outrun a Diodon in a straight chase. Only uh. one out of every ten hunts is likely to be successful. His hunger will drive him to try again, and an animal of his size must feed soon. You know what? We should have a, a command, Claire. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind helping put together a, a Nightbot command for this, Claire, it would be... Uh, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, right now they're trying to fund this on Kickstarter. It's a really, really cool project. And... Uh, there we go. They are roughly halfway to their goal. And look, it's Mike. Oh, thank you for the two months of support there. Really appreciate that, Mike. I really, really do. Thank you, thank you. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. I hope you're doing well. 
Good to see you. Yeah. Uh. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, very very cool, independently produced documentary. They're working on and they're seeking funding for it. Uh, I've already backed this project. I gave them forty-five dollars on Friday. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be really really cool. We really need more media like this, and I really, really hope this project is successful. This is uh, something really, really cool. So anyway, but it features North American ancient camels. These guys. So anyway, let's get back to what we were actually scheduled to be doing here. Uh, yeah... And let's take a look at this random video that I found the other day, which is already racking up views. 121,000 views in two weeks. And it's about dinosaurs of the Cretaceous period. We're going to be doing a lot of pausing here and a lot of talking. Hopefully not too much sneering. Let's watch it. The Cretaceous period was the time of the rapid development for the dinosaurs. Across <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> oh, we're like three seconds in. Okay, let's hear that again. Cretaceous period was the time of the rapid development for the dinosaurs. The time of the rapid development for the dinosaurs. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, sure. All of the messes O'Kara was. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Um, wasn't that the Triassic, says Jody Fish? I mean... Dinosaurs are ever changing, you know. They're 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 still changing today, um, in the form of birds. But uh, I don't know. Maybe they mean like there were major clades of dinosaurs that arose during the Cretaceous. But first, let me outline for you. Let's let's talk about timeline here. Uh, uh, Mary Space says he's probably reading from an AI generated script. He very well might be Mary Space. We'll see. Yeah. Um. Hey, Nainir, Nainir Ramikut, how are you doing, Nainir? Welcome, welcome. How are you? Welcome back. It's good to see you. Makes me smile that you returned. All right, let's let's talk about time here. Because I think something that a lot of people fail to realize is just how long the age of dinosaurs is. But before we even get to that. This is where we are today. Uh, this is the present, is this line up here. The Cenozoic Era, often known as the Age of Mammals, is right here. It goes from today all the way back to 66 million years ago. This is the Age of Mammals. Now, this in blue is the Mesozoic Era. It is far longer than the Cenozoic. This is often referred to as the Age of Dinosaurs. Um, from 66 million years ago until about 252 million years ago, give or take, down here. So, yeah. Uh, so anyway, the age of dinosaurs is really long. Dinosaurs first evolve probably about here, probably about 240 million years ago, in like the middle Triassic. Although maybe it was the beginning of the upper Triassic. It's funny, the Triassic is like very unevenly split. The lower, and then the middle, and then the upper is, like, the four-fifths of it. Um, anyway, but dinosaurs first show up about 240 million years ago, as far as we can tell. We haven't found the earliest one yet, but we found ones close to that, and they're approaching this age here. Anyway, the Cretaceous period is what this video is about. The Cretaceous period goes from... 145 million years ago. 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. George from New York. Holy cow! Thank you so much, George. I really appreciate that. Are leading this expedition. Holy cow! That is extraordinary, George. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting science outreach here on Twitch. Seriously, that means a great deal to me. Thank you. Thank you. Look, we're now at 9 out of 50 for our goal today. Five of those were from George right there, so thank you, thank you, George. Holy cow. Appreciate you. Oh. How are you doing, George, by the way? 
Hope things are good. Hope you had a great weekend. It's great to have you back. Anyway, we're talking about the Cretaceous period here. So, most of the the dinosaurs that you've heard of, chat, most of the, the most popular dinosaurs from pop culture are from the Cretaceous. So whether it's Tyrannosaurus or Velociraptor, Parasaurolophus or Ankylosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, they're from the Cretaceous period. Same with Carnotaurus and... Yeah. Um, the Cretaceous... People often say that's where dinosaurs have their, uh, their peak diversity, and I suppose that's true in a certain sense. But yeah, anyway. It's interesting to note that the, the Cretaceous period here is even longer than the entire Cenozoic era. The Cretaceous period is longer than the entire Age of Mammals. So when a video like this asks the question, what happened with dinosaurs... During the Cretaceous period, it's like, uh, well, shoot, I don't know. Um, a lot, a lot happened. <laughs> a whole lot happened. So let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're, you're not feeling well, George? I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, shoot, I hope you're taking care of yourself. I hope you're resting up, and, uh, again, thank you for your support, George. It, um, it really does mean a lot to me. Uh, hope you're drinking, you know, plenty of liquids. Hope you're, uh, you're getting some rest. You take care of yourself, George. Yeah. I've I rewound several seconds to the beginning of this. Let's start it over, I guess. Yeah. Hey, there's a thought. You could hire a dinosaur to put a swimming pool in your backyard. All you have I... to do is show up for five minutes. Whop! Instant swimming pool. Okay, whimsy. <laughs> Thank you so much for the 13 months of support. 13 months. That's almost a whole year, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you, whimsy. I really appreciate you. Holy cow. Um. Thank you for keeping me online for the past 13 months, Whimsy. Could not do this without the support of generous contributors like you, so thank you, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's try this again. Uh, Hold on to your butts. Let's watch it. The Cretaceous period was the time of the rapid development for the dinosaurs. <laughs> Across the world, these ancient creatures have evolved into many impressive forms, each one fighting for dominance in the battle for survival. Uh, it's one way to put it, I suppose. I don't know. They're critters doing their thing, and they're surviving and evolving, sure. But each one fighting for dominance in the battle for survival. It, okay. The Cretaceous was a time when some of the most awe-inspiring herbivores and most terrifying predators from the planet. Imagine towering Argentinosaurus reaching. This is direct from Jurassic World Evolution, the video game, isn't it? Oh boy. Uh, uh, seven. And you still can't hear it? I just turned it up to 300%. And you still can't hear the video? Let's turn it up to 400%. Stories. A formidable carcarodonosaur. That's too loud now. That's way too loud. Let me turn it down to 270%. Let's try this. Yeah. It looks even more threatening than the name suggests. Or a heavily armored ankylosaurus. Armed with That's not ankylosaurus. This is some kind of non-ankylosaurian. Ankylosaurid ankylosaur. You see the big shoulder spikes like that? This is like sauropelta or... You know, this is like a... A polycanthine, or... It's not Ankylosaurus. It's not Ankylosaurus. A club-shaped tail. Could be Polycanthus, Tarquin, yeah. I don't know. These creatures were willing to give up an inch. And the competition never ceased, as there was an endless struggle for the right to survive. Yeah, not Ankylosaurus. The strongest and toughest species could secure a place at the top of the food chain. Are these supposed to be Spinosaurus here? <laughs> I suppose that's not the worst Spinosaurus I've ever seen. 
It was a little baby. That's really funny. Yeah. Uh, you don't know your ankylosaurs very well, Tarquin? Well, shoot, there's so many different ankylosaurs. Yeah. Uh, and Kaya in the Sky says it's like 25% of your local volume right now. Really? Because it's, it's hurting my ear. It's so loud. I don't know what's up with that. Here, let me turn it up here. We'll try that. But this great era of dinosaur domination ended abruptly. Is that better? Catastrophically with a truly harrowing event. And what in the world is this? Who is this supposed to be? Like, what the actual heck? And that's much better. So That's so weird. I just fiddle the dial a tiny bit and suddenly it's way better. I appreciate your patience, everybody, as we fiddle with the uh, volume here. But hopefully that'll do it now. You know? Is this supposed to be like Protoceratops or something? Or a Leptoceratopsid? There's some sort of awful sculpt here. These are all like, you know, it's all stock footage that they're just stitching together. Uh, this is bad. Anyway. Domination ended abruptly and catastrophically with a truly harrowing event that led to the tragic extinction of most dinosaur species and forever changed the course of life on Earth. <laughs> Again, because this is from something called Space Matters. I wonder how you say that. Is it Space Matters? Like matters of space or is it you know space matters maybe it's both i don't know but uh you'd think a channel like space matters if it is space related you know they would have uh i don't know maybe better depictions of the Which asteroid impact here? dinosaur species and forever change so it, there's like a, this is like a curveball it, it's like curving into the earth that's really weird look at the arc of this right here the course of life on Earth. <laughs> the uh, end of the Jurassic period marks. Oh, uh, what in the world is this? That's gar this garbage. Uh, the teeth are all sticking out sideways out of the dentary and everything, and just. Ah. Uh, uh. This has got to be from some kind of media here, right? Gianmi says, from Speckles the Tarbosaur. Wait. Oh, is this that, um, is it Korean or, or Chinese? Speckles the Tarbosaurus. What the heck? Hmm. The Cretaceous period, 80 million years ago. Yeah, I don't think we have any of these dinosaurs from the Korean Peninsula. <laughs> Oh, we've got a Tyrannosaurus 80 million years ago and in Korea. So that's supposed to be... Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, okay, I guess that explains it. At least they didn't say 60... Well, it's it's further away, Tommy Plotticus. They said 80. <laughs> Instead of 1 million year off, they were... Yeah, but, but anyway, staying positive here. Staying positive. Um, yeah, so Tyrannosaurus did not live in the Jurassic, so this is even wronger than Speckles the Tarbosaurus was. Tyrannosaurus is from the very, very end of the Age of Dinosaurs. So this actually... Here, it's a great time to talk about this. Uh, Tyrannosaurus lived here at the, the tail end of the Cretaceous period. So the Cretaceous is really long. Tyrannosaurus lived at the very end of it. The Hell Creek and the Lance and the Scholard formations of North America about 68 to 66 million years ago. And the Jurassic is way down here, 145 million years ago. T-Rex is actually closer in time to you and me. 
than it is to the Jurassic period. That's how long the Age of Dinosaurs is, and how disparate Tyrannosaurus is from the Jurassic. Um, yeah. So, I don't know, there's, uh... Here. Uh... You've probably seen this before. There you go. This classic tableau of a Tyrannosaurus fighting a Stegosaurus. Who can tell me what's wrong with that? This is at Disneyland, of course. On the Disneyland Railroad. Me too, Tarquin. I'm right there with you, Tarquin. But this part is... It's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, Jody Fish says Stegosaurus was from the Jurassic. This is true. Yeah. They didn't live at the same time. Stegosaurus is Jurassic. Yes, indeed. Man, I, I love this community. You guys are great. Holy cow. You people are wonderful. It's true. Tyrannosaurus right here lived at the very end of the Cretaceous period. Stegosaurus lived at the end of the Jurassic, like 80 million years before. So there's 80 million years between them. 80 million years separating them. Tyrannosaurus is only separated from us by 66 million years. So, strictly speaking, or I don't know, if you want to want to get wild with it, while still being, you know, chronologically accurate, I guess? I don't know. This at Disneyland would have been more accurate if the Tyrannosaurus were, uh, were fighting with Abraham Lincoln from Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln rather than a Stegosaurus. That at least, you know, would have made more sense chronologically. That would have been less of a stretch between them time-wise. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So this right here, um, basura, garbage. Uh, Tyrannosaurus is not from the Jurassic, and that's not even a good Tyrannosaurus. Uh, uh, we're a minute and 16 seconds into the video. And uh, already I'm beginning to regret this choice. Uh, period marks the beginning of the Cretaceous period. The final period of the Mesozoic era. It's oh, this is so. F oh no, 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 no! We'll deal with you in a second. Hang on. Uh so you, this is like a big macronarian sauropod, like a brachiosaur. Their heyday was the Jurassic. So they're showing a, an admittedly bad Tyrannosaur for the Jurassic, and then they show a bad Brachiosaur for the Cretaceous. They should have switched those. Oh, man. Oh, man. It spanned over a long period of time. Uh, and this. They're showing made-up dinosaurs here. This is the Jurassic World Indominus Rex right here. Oh, uh, so a made-up fictional dinosaur. This is not real. And this is purportedly like an educational video here, right? I mean, let's take a look at this channel. Space Matters. Um, about. Uh, welcome to the official YouTube channel, Space Matters. Space Matters is a channel dedicated to bringing the cosmos to you in a way that is exciting, fun, and easy for everyone to understand. I, well, at least they didn't say true or <laughs> scientifically authentic. <laughs> Because that would have been, oh, yeah. Uh, our goal is to become one of the most popular space science channels on YouTube among stargazers and astronomers alike. Oh, boy. I mean, I, I, I'm not an astronomer myself. I don't know a lot about space science. That is outside of my field. I've never published a paper in an astronomy journal. I don't know if I've ever actually read a paper in an astronomy journal. No. I've read a few, actually. But anyway. I I say that to state that I am a dinosaur paleontologist. You know, I work on dinosaurs. 
And so I can really only judge the content that they do about dinosaurs with any degree of expertise. And so far, this is not... It's not... It's not great. It's not great. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and Trappy Jenkins, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um, and Alta 4... Nope. That's not a Nirvana cover, although I do have Nirvana... Covers of Nirvana songs. But this is not from Nirvana. No, Alta 4. This is from a different, like, surf rock person. Anyway. Yeah. Uh... Uh, but, oh, Nir did Nirvana also cover uh, The Man Who Sold the World? I didn't know that. Cool. I suppose this could be a cover of Nirvana's cover of the song. But yeah, yeah. Cool. Anyway. Uh, it is a great song, Alta 4. It really is. We'll continue it later, but... Uh... Yeah, Sefi says famously on MTV Live. Really? They covered it live. That's cool. It's a great song. Anyway, they're throwing in just made-up fictional fake dinosaurs in here. Uh, I'm from 145 to 65 million years ago. Oh, no. This video came out two weeks ago. This is also wrong. <laughs> You know, I again not not to be super nitpicky or or sneering about this, you know. Uh I'm starting to wish I did have like a counter. You know, so we could go you know? Um when we have stuff like this. Um but yeah, like if this is purportedly a science YouTube channel. Maybe they should consult some actual science, you know? Oh, boy. Anyway, yeah, it's 66 million years ago. We've known this for a solid 10 years at this point, you know? I think it was... When was that, actually? Let's let's see. Maybe we'll, we'll talk for a minute about how these dates are determined also. Um... Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary. There we go. Uh, its age is usually estimated at around 66 million years, with radiometric dating yielding a more precise age of 66.043 plus or minus 0 0.011 million years. So there you go. Uh, yep, and we've known about this for just approaching 10 years now. So for a decade, we've known about this. No, more than a decade now. February 8th, 2013. There you go. It's been over a decade that we've had those more precise dates, you know? And so there's really no excuse for a science channel. If this were like, you know, uh, some, you know, Kim Kardashian channel about makeup tips or uh, insider trading or something like that. Whatever wealthy people do. Um, then it wouldn't really matter, you know. But they're purporting to be a science channel. You know, it's, uh, it's not great. It's not great. Anyway, here's a link to this paper in the journal Science. Um... This is cool because Paul Rennie, uh, who's the lead author on this, he's a geochronologist at UC Berkeley, just down the road from me here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I've actually done field work with Paul Rennie and his students out in the Hell Creek Formation. That was in 2014, I want to say. So it was like a year after they published this. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and Tarquin says plus or minus 11,000 years. That's, that's the timescales we're dealing with. That's, that's precision. 
uh, when you're dealing with stuff that's tens of millions of years old, you know? Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to our video. Uh, so yeah, it's 66, not 65. We've got good dates now. We've had them for a decade at this point. There's no excuse for this. There's no excuse for this. Yeah. During this time, many different types of dinosaurs developed on our planet, including some of the largest and most iconic creatures to ever exist. True. As the Jurassic gave way to the Cretaceous, dominant fauna began to change and new groups of dinosaurs, such as the Ceratopsians and Theropods, grew to carry increasingly more importance. I mean, Theropods were already... It's true, Ceratopsians did not really... They weren't really a thing yet in the Jurassic. Not really. You've got some very early, early critters that would, you know, like Choyangosaurus, I think. Uh, yeah. Shoot, what is... Or Yinlong, maybe? Uh, Yinlong might be a better example. And here we go. This is what your horned dinosaurs looked like during the Jurassic. They're just starting off, you know? Uh, look at those doofy little teeth. <laughs> uh, see, a horned dinosaurs, the Ceratopsians, don't really show up until the Cretaceous. Uh, I think this might be the most basal Ceratopsian, isn't it? The earliest Ceratopsian that we have. Yeah. Most other described Ceratopsians are known from the later Cretaceous period. So this guy, with that skull like that, those doofy teeth. Um, yeah, this is what they looked like in the Jurassic. So this part is true. And that's a lousy Triceratops they have there, but it's true. Ceratopsians are very much a Cretaceous group. They're not really a thing yet in the Jurassic. I'm actually kind of impressed with this Dromaeosaur here. It could be a lot worse. Is this supposed to be like Ostroraptor? Not too shabby. Anyway, theropods have been around since the Triassic, so... Saying, oh, theropods grew to be more important during the Cretaceous. It's like, well, they were already the only meat-eating dinosaurs. ...and theropods grew uh, to carry increasingly more importance. Yeah, theropods were already there. They're there basically since the beginning. The yeah. Cretaceous period is divided into two epochs, early Cretaceous and late Cretaceous. The early Cretaceous... Hang on, what? Why do they have Archaeopteryx there? That's supposed to be Archaeopteryx, right? That's from the Jurassic. Oh, boy. And Parasaurolophus is from the late Cretaceous. Uh, it's just like, just randomly thrown in stock assets here. This presumably would have been an expensive video to produce because they're getting a lot of this footage from, like, you know, probably Getty Images or whatever stock footage purveyor they could find these things on, but all these things cost money. Like, I almost kind of wonder what this is, whether this is like a corporate backed channel, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many videos do they have so far? Oh boy. Uh, it's a whole bunch of clickbait. Life came out. How life started. On, oh, no. Anyway, this is. I don't know. This feels like slapped together by some sort of corporate entity. And it's. Uh, it makes me sad. You know. Uh... Epochs. Early Cretaceous and late Cretaceous. The early Cretaceous <sighs> period, which took place between 140. So I think this is supposed to be a pat. Oh, no, 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 this is some sort of titanosaur, isn't it? It's not a patasaurus. 45 and 100 anyway. million years ago saw the diversification of dinosaurs and the emergence of new groups such as orinthopods and sauropods. No, no, what? What? Uh... Neither of these were new groups during the... These had both been around since the, the Jurassic, the earliest Jurassic, right? Or ornithopods, well, I don't know. Ornithopods are, like, very much a Jurassic group. 
you know, they're there in the Cretaceous too, but they did not emerge during the Cretaceous. Also, that's a terrible Parasaurolophus. Just dog water. Garbage. And a terrible sauropod. Like, uh... Gah! This is wrong. This is wrong. So this group, Ornithopods, they're already around during the Jurassic. Let's talk about them a little bit. Yeah, Ornithopoda. Yeah. Uh, clade of Ornithischian dinosaurs. Where, let's see. Description. Let's get into their origins as a group because they. Sh wow, this is actually not all that clear here. This might be. Well, no, never. There we go. They do explicitly state it there. They're from the Middle Jurassic to the Late Cretaceous. They do not show up during the Cretaceous period. I guess if critters like Heterodontosaurus or Fabrosaurus are not considered true ornithopods, but like more basal ornithischian dinosaurs, then you can't say that they extend into the earliest Jurassic or the Triassic either. But uh, anyway, ornithopods are already very much there during the Jurassic. So we're sauropods, for that matter, you know? Yeah. Nope, sauropods are actually date back to the late Triassic. <laughs> Even further than I thought. Ah, uh, yeah. Anyway. And Rune Lore says, have they managed a single sentence that hasn't been passed due to being inaccurate? I mean, yes, but I was being charitable there, Rune Lore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And uh, Ninir says, Ninir wants to redeem a dinosaur deep dive. Can you hear me now? Let me know if you can hear me. Uh, uh, we're back? And you can hear me. Good. Okay. I'm sorry about that. It's just... It was an OBS crash where the program, my broadcasting software, just <clears throat> froze up and, uh, yeah, fatal error. Anyway, we're back. Thank you, everybody, who didn't run away during that. Um, I wonder how many people did run away. I guess we'll see. But, yeah, yeah, we are back in business, Gianmi. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, anywho, yeah. Uh, Ninir had a dinosaur deep dive requested on toe bones of ornithopods? Oh, Ninir, can you explain what you mean by that? Normally a dinosaur deep dive, we do it on a specific, you know, on a genus of dinosaur, or sometimes a genus and species. But to just say, like, ornithopod pedal phalanx, like ornithopod toe bone, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Um... Anyway, yeah. Uh, copper lights occur, that's true, Lenina. That is definitely true. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back into our video. Uh, so yeah, neither of these groups actually arose in the Cretaceous, so that is wrong. Let's go back just a titch, though, to make sure that I, I didn't mishear that. Let's see. ...and the emergence of new groups such as orinthopods and sauropods. Oh, boy. ...and the emergence of new groups such as orinthopods and sauropods. So sauropods go back to the Triassic period, and ornithopods... Did that dude really say orinthopods? Oh, boy. Yeah. Um... Uh, it's ornithopods. So not only is this completely wrong, <laughs> it's like not even convincingly spoken. Like he's pronouncing it wrong too. Oh boy. Um. Anyway. In the emergence of new groups. 
jazz or rhinthopods and sauropods. Oh, boy. This was also the time yeah. when the first birds evolved from the small feathered theropods. No, it's not. Birds are from the Jurassic. This is also completely wrong. Did they have ChatGPT write this whole script? This is garbage. Oh, no. So birds first show up in the Jurassic period. You know? Let me show you. Uh... So Archaeopteryx, this lovely critter here, I love this illustration of Archaeopteryx, really nice. Archaeopteryx is from the Jurassic, famously from the late Jurassic period of Germany, Bavaria. There we go. Archaeopteryx, yeah. Uh, during the late Jurassic, 150 million years ago. That's this critter. I've got a 3D print of this animal. Right back there, that same specimen, what's referred to as the Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx. Right back here. It's also completely wrong. It's saying, oh, birds first evolved in the Jurassic. Uh, for, excuse me. Saying birds first evolved in the Cretaceous. That's completely, completely wrong. This is just... Uh, totally wrong about this. This was also the time when the first birds evolved from the small feathered theropods. The late Cretaceous... I mean, yes. Birds did evolve from small feathered theropods. That part's correct, but it was back in the Jurassic. We've known this for, like... We've known since the discovery of Archaeopteryx. Way back in the 1860s, that birds date back to the Jurassic period. We've known this for well over, for 150 years, let's say, almost. Well, what, 2023 minus 1860, 1861, what's that? Anyway, we've known this for a long, long time. There's no excuse for that. This is just completely lazy and, uh, it's downright embarrassing. Which took place between 100 and 65 million years 66 ago. 66 million years brought ago. Brought even more oh dramatic boy. changes to. Oh Earth. boy. One of the most significant events of this time. Was Thank you, Jody Fish. It's a long time. The Pangaea supercontinent uh. into separate land masses of Laurasia and Gondwana, which ultimately led to the formation of modern continents. This created the conditions for the evolution of unique dinosaur fauna on every continent. New environment also led to the emergence of new types of dinosaurs adapted to the specific conditions of their habitat. I mean, the late all of this so far, that's th this is true. Right here. Created the conditions. Here. One of the most significant events of this time was the tectonic breakup of the Pangaea supercontinent in December. Well, uh, Pangaea was already breaking up in the Jurassic, though. Like, you already have the Atlantic that starts to open up. That's already happening by, like, the late Triassic Pangaea is already starting to break up. So, I don't know. It, that's kind of wrong, but... Yeah. Yeah. ...land masses of Laurasia and Gondwana, which ultimately led to the formation of modern continents. And where did they get this? <laughs> so goofy looking. Shoot, there's a, a wonderful free resource that I'd like to share with you. Uh, there we go. Let's go back to, say, the early Cretaceous. Let's try... Uh, 120 million years ago. There we go. This is a much better representation of what Earth would have looked like back then. You know? This is goofy. It's a stock image from some website. This is a free resource that you can check out yourself. It's interactive. It's really, really cool. Um, but yeah, this is kind of what they're talking about. So here, we'll go back further in time to say the beginning of the Age of Dinosaurs. This is Pangaea right here, where you've got all the continents, Africa, South America, North America, uh, Australia, Antarctica, India, all shunted together like that. There's Europe and Asia. 
Though it may not seem like much, 500 bits goes a long way towards well, thank supporting you, science. Well. I'll click here on Twitch. A pong squint, a pong SLAP here, Danny, for the emotional damage. Thank you, Lilith Hobo. I appreciate you very much. Holy cow. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and Shara Danicus, there's several videos on YouTube. Yeah, I don't know why they use this garbage right here when there's like, there's all these wonderful resources like this. So here, let's go back to the early Cretaceous into the late Cretaceous like we're talking about. This is what Earth looked like at the time, more or less. There's India, Africa, South America. This is what we call Gondwana down here. So the continents kind of start to break apart. And the two, when Pangaea starts to separate, we still refer to two supercontinents after its breakup. You've got Laurasia up north. That's North America, Europe, and Asia. Laurasia. And then down south, you've got Gondwana. South America, Africa, India, Madagascar, Antarctica, Australia, New Zealand, uh, down here in Gondwana. So yeah, there's a, a famous bumper sticker. Um, this was popular in the 90s. Uh... Well, actually, I can't find an original. But anyway, here we go. Reunite Gondwana. This is kind of a joke. I think that's Alfred Wagner right there. The guy who uh, kind of came up with the idea of continental drift. That is Wagner, right? Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Why is it called Laurasia? You know, Nell, I don't know. Let's look that up real quick. Yeah. Wikipedia, what is the etymology of Laurasia? Um, uh, let's see. Laurasia! Let's just look up etymology of Laurasia. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's Laurentian plus the second element of Eurasia. Okay, so I guess it's sort of a portmanteau of Laurentia and Asia. Yeah. Because it comprises North America and Eurasia. So let's look up. Laurentia is named after the St. Lawrence River? Really? Oh, there we go. Okay, this is why. Yeah. The North American Craton. So it's a portmanteau of Laurentia and Eurasia. You combine them together... Laurasia. Does that make sense? I hope so. Yeah. Laurentian Eurasia. There you go, Tarquin. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Let's continue here. This created the conditions for the evolution of unique dinosaur fauna on every continent. New environment also led to the emergence of new types of dinosaurs adapted to the specific conditions of their habitat. Sure. The late Cretaceous was also the epoch that saw the appearance of the first flowering plants. That's also incorrect. Flowering plants are from the early Cretaceous. Famously, flowering plants first evolve in the early Cretaceous period. It's completely wrong. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, and I can show you a, a lovely little clip about that. Um... It also features Iguanodon. Is this... Yeah, here we go. Iguanodon, famously from the 
early Cretaceous, along with the first of the flowering plants. Stegosaurs didn't eat flowers. You're right. Iconic song. Yeah. Stegosaurs never would have seen flowers. There we go. Yeah. And this again is during the early Cretaceous. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is not me nitpicking here. Early Cretaceous, late Cretaceous, same thing, right? No, we're talking about 80 million years. That's a tremendous amount of time, you know? The Cretaceous is a long time period. So early Cretaceous, late Cretaceous, holy cow. Flowering plants first show up in the early Cretaceous. That's a well-known fact, and they got it completely wrong. Chronological mangling. <laughs> Golgonek, thank you for those 300 bits. Yeah, there you go. Uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, for what they get right and what they get wrong, says Asazi. I mean, most of it's been wrong so far. Uh, and again, trying to stay positive here. Trying to stay positive here. It's cool that a, a YouTube channel, you know, they want to produce videos on dinosaurs. It'd just be nice if they, you know, took care to get things right. Uh, yeah. To the specific conditions of their habitat. Yeah. Oh, the Eolambia. Okay, Nina. We can do that. Epoch that saw the appearance of the first flowering plants. No, flowering which had plants a major are early Cretaceous. On the ecosystems of that time, making changes to food chains and the ways dinosaurs interacted with flora. Furthermore, as sea levels began to rise, flooding low-lying areas and creating the shallow waters we see today. Uh, uh, and again, it's just, there's all these grasses here. It's clearly footage from today. Grasses did not exist during the Cretaceous like this. It gave way for the new marine uh, ecosystems to develop. At oh, the time, boy. And, uh, so they didn't know this. Today, it gave but Spinosaurus could not swim underwater like this. Yeah. <laughs> I'll hand them this. It's like, shoot, uh. A lot of paleontologists have argued for this, but no. I, I work on spinosaurs. I am completely unconvinced that this was possible. These animals are not crocodiles. They're far too buoyant. You know, they float up like corks right here. Um, various studies have shown this. Anyway, yeah. Way for the yeah. new marine ecosystems to develop. At the time, the aquatic life was bountiful and varied. There's some Mosasaurus. As the Cretaceous period went on, the continents began to slowly shift apart and take on their current form. The once unified landmass of Pangaea gradually gave way to the separate landmasses of Laurasia and Gondwana, and eventually the modern continents we know today. Okay. Due to this event, the dinosaurs less that once roamed freely across Pangaea were now isolated on their... Why are they showing... What is this, Acrocanthosaurus here? <laughs> Yeah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Respected landmass, surrounded by unique and distinctive flora and fauna. Yeah. The... Okay, well, that's a nice point. We should talk about Eolambia now for Niner. Let's talk about Eolambia real quick. Eolambia is a... Is it a... Basal most Lambiosaurine, or is it just a basal hadrosaur? Let's see. Uh, Eolambia. I'm trying to remember this critter. Is this the one I'm thinking of from Utah? Yeah! <laughs> uh, so this is an animal. We actually discussed this uh, 
during my interview with Jim Kirkland last summer. Uh, end of July or, or beginning of August, when I was talking with Jim in the field, the state paleontologist of Utah, we were talking about Eolambia. So Eolambia, Eolambia Carol Jonesa, is named after a particular woman who I think originally discovered the specimen. And her husband has a dinosaur named after him. I think they are the only married couple in the entire world who each have a dinosaur named after them. It's uh, Eolambia, Carol Jonesa, and S I forget the genus Ramal Jonesi. But yeah, yeah. Uh, discovered by Carol and Ramal Jones in 1993. The specimen name honors Carol. Uh, yeah, since then, hundreds of bones have been discovered from both adults and juveniles, representing nearly every element of the skeleton, which is really rare for a dinosaur like this. So anyway, this is a early duckbill dinosaur. An Eolambia. Anytime you hear that prefix Eo in a name... Eo means early. It means dawn. It means, like, the beginning of something. So Eolambia, like the dawn lambiosaur, dawn hadrosaur. I think it's it's it derives its name from lambiosaurus, named after Lawrence Lamb. So yeah, yeah. And wait, Rodansis the Carnegies did too. Oh, you're right, Rodan, you're right. Yeah. Diplodocus Carnegii and Apatosaurus Louise, named after uh, Andrew Carnegie's Andrew Carnegie's wife, Louise. Rodan. Ding, 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 ding. Holy cow. Um, You're absolutely right about that, Rodan. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent, Rodan. It's funny because I thought I thought I heard Jim also say that this. Uh, anyway, that those are they're I guess they're the only two living people, the only two living married couple with dinosaurs named after both of them. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, Eolambia, very very cool. Uh, large member of its group. Let's see, where, do, where does it fall in? Is it a basal lambiosaurine or is it something else? It was originally interpreted as a basal lambiosaurine. Okay. But what an important dinosaur. Shoot, Eolambia. I really need to learn more about this critter. Uh, it's from the Mustn't Touch member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. This is where I was working last summer, but the Cedar Mountain Formation is huge, huge, huge. There's like, f what, 30 or 40 million years represented in the Cedar Mountain Formation? It's pretty nuts. Uh, yeah, yeah. Pretty crazy. Here, give me just a second, and I will grab you a, uh, a sheet that I'll show you on the desktop camera. Just a second. Uh, this is a special sheet produced by Jim Kirkland and the Utah Friends of Paleontology. Um, showing like a, you know, a chronological timeline of different dinosaurs from Utah. Utah seems to hold the record for the most dinosaurs named out of any U.S. state. Over 115 dinosaur species in 27 sequential faunal levels. So here you've got the dinosaurs on the right, and on the left, you've got uh, the different uh, geologic formations that they're from. And so, you know, you've got the Morrison Formation with Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Apatosaurus, etc., Navajo Sandstone, Temple Cap Formation, etc. 
Cedar Mountain Formation is crazy long. It goes from the very beginning of the Cretaceous down here, uh, like close to 135 million years ago, maybe even older, up to less than 100 million years ago. This, this sucker's like 40 million years long. And Eolambia is up in the mustn't touch it member. So Eolambia is right there. Uh, I was working in the lowest part of the Cedar Mountain Formation this past summer on these critters and this new Iguanodontian right here. Iguana Colossus and uh, other new taxa. So yeah, we might have a new Iguanodontian uh, that we were digging up last summer. We're going to see if we can get more of it this year. So yeah, yeah. So it's, it's kind of nuts. The Cedar Mountain Formation is crazy long. They should really subdivide it up into other formations because it's, it's too long. It's, yeah, yeah, the different members of the Cedar Mountain should honestly become their own formations. Um, but anyway... Yeah, and uh, and Ninir says I picked this one because of a paragraph in an article I was reading. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of dinosaur material from Oregon. You're right. Um, the pedal phalanx is believed to belong to Eolambia or Tenontosaurus. Oh, I got you, Ninir. So the, why they're saying that is because Eolambia and Tenontosaurus are both ornithopod dinosaurs from the early Cretaceous. Uh, I'll show you Tenontosaurus, too. It's another one of these beaky plant-eating dinosaurs. Tenontosaurus has got a crazy long tail. And... Yeah, Tenontosaurus. Um, here's one eating a Deinonychus. <laughs> plant-eating... Most of the time. I love this, because usually it's Deinonychus eating Tenontosaurus. That's a story for another time. But anyway. Yeah. Well, it's a lovely Tenontosaurus there. Really nice. Crazy long tail. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And Ru Rune Lore says, I wonder if that's just from a period of heavy deposition making the formation thick? It's not actually that thick in certain places, though. It just represents a ton of time. So it might be very slow deposition over a really, really long amount of time. You know? Yeah. So anyway. Ninontosaurus. Oh no, Mayor Space. <laughs> uh, Tenontosaurus in the game The Isle look nice. They do kind of look nice. Yeah. That's a neat depiction. You know what? That's not bad at all. I actually... Man, it's pretty... That's pretty okay. Kind of impressed with that. Yeah. Anyway. And Green Panthera? Could have happened. Tenontosaurus eating meat? I mean, I think... So, yeah. Here's... There we go. Uh, Tenontosaurus eating a Deinonychus just because it can. This is the thing, is that in most illustrations of uh, Deinonychus and Tenontosaurus... Yeah. You just... It, it almost seems like Tenontosaurus only exists in art to be torn apart by roving packs of Deinonychus. You know? It's like, that's the only time you would ever see it. Especially in, like, 1990s paleo media. You would never see Tenontosaurus unless it's being just ripped asunder by roving groups of Deinonychus. So, yeah. So there... This artist was, uh, was trying to Strike a blow for Tenontosaurus everywhere. Reverse the rolls there. So, yeah. Yeah. They're just playing. He'll be fine, says Green Man there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anywho. 
Enough Spider-Man music. <laughs> let's, uh... Let's continue our video here. Oh, boy. Cretaceous, the Earth was ruled by gigantic creatures, each with their own unique strengths and weaknesses. Uh, uh, why are they showing a Spinosaur? Spinosaurs famously went extinct in the early Cretaceous. They don't make it into the late Cretaceous. <laughs> they're, they're like Cinemanian at the at the youngest, which a Cinemanian early or late? It's right in the middle. I would call it middle Cretaceous. But anyway, Spinosaurids don't. They go extinct at like the end of the Cinemanian. At the heart of the North America, uh, a fierce battle was about to unfold between the most powerful predators and the most persistent herbivores. Tyrannosaurus Rex, the king of the predators, roamed oh the land boy. in search of his next prey. Jurassic World Evolution it was again. One of the largest land predators ever to have existed, reaching a True. length of 39 feet weighing about seven tons. That's funny because they've probably overestimated the weight and underestimated the length. <laughs> we have Tyrannosaurus specimens that are over 40 feet long. You know, I think Sue is about 42 feet long. Uh, she's like, yeah, approaching 14 meters, I think. Um... Yeah, and there's other, like, the Canadians have got Tyrannosaurus specimens that they claim are larger, too. Um, yeah, yeah, anyway. Uh, you've never heard of this dinosaur, really, Green Panthera? This one here? <laughs> That's such a lousy stock image Tyrannosaurus, too. This is, oh, this is garbage. Garbage. Armed with massive jaws and razor sh and uh, there are so many images of of Tyrannosaurus skulls from around the world. Why would you, why would you use like a, uh, this is garbage. What even is this? Uh, this is like a sculpt that somebody did. There is probably no dinosaur in the world that's easier to get like actual photos of the skull of Tyrannosaurus in. I don't know for any bird people here in the in the chat um a bird equivalent of this this is it this is oh. the horizon which marks the extinction of the dinosaurs oh, holy cow gold frappuccino Below this level and out in here there are dinosaur fossils above this level on these rocks there are no dinosaur fossils so i'm actually standing on the level that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs yeah 66 gold million years ago and their nine raiders have stumbled below that level Let's talk dinosaurs. Yes, indeed. Welcome, welcome. Uh, he'll tell you that in nature. <laughs> Old Frappuccino, how was your stream? I hope it was really, really good. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? That's great to have you here. Yeah. An average born, thank you for your follow. Welcome, welcome. Let me introduce myself real quick to Gold Frappuccino and Raiders. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. As you could probably guess, looking at my office here. Um, I work on dinosaurs. I dig up dinosaurs with various museums across the western U.S. I publish on dinosaurs in the scientific literature. That's what I was working on this weekend. And, uh, and now I talk about dinosaurs five days a week right here on Victoria's Twitch. Gifted a tier one sub to gold thank you, Victarius, for gifting Gold Frappuccino. Really appreciate that. Channel. Thank you. Thank you, Victarius. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, average born. Thank you again for the follow. And uh, Gold Frappuccino says had a lovely stream. Thank you. Hope you're well. I am well. Thank you for bringing everybody here. I appreciate that. Let me know if you've got any questions about dinosaurs, about evolution, extinction, natural history in general. I'm here on Twitch to do science outreach to talk to people about science and I believe pretty firmly that our world would be a better place if more scientists had the opportunity to reach out to the public and talk to people and just you know have a heart to heart about our work and how it impacts 
world around us, our understanding of the world around us. It's incredible history. Too many scientists are overworked, underpaid. They don't really have an opportunity to reach out and talk to folks. I'm super lucky that I get to do this five days a week thanks to the support of this wonderful community here. So, so if you've got questions, stuff you're curious about, it's literally what I'm here for. So please do not be shy with those questions. Welcome to Paleontology. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, anyway, right now we're watching this video. This is a very, like, clickbaity kind of video from, uh, I think this is like, I, I think it's like a company that runs this channel called Space Matters. And, oh my goodness, what is this, this image here? Oh, I want to, ah, shoot, I want to open that image in a new tab and it won't let me. Anyway, this looks like an AI generated, it's like a, Tyrannosaur that's on fire? Uh, anyway. It's been, um... It's been very uninspiring so far. But we're kind of watching this video about Cretaceous dinosaurs, and it seems like about 50% of the facts that they're purporting are incorrect. So we've been talking about that. We're trying to have a good time doing it. Trying to avoid getting too angry. And I was just talking about how this... This is supposed to be a Tyrannosaurus skull right here. Which, you know, shoot, if you do a Google image search for Tyrannosaurus skull, you'll find so many different results. Some are better than others, but like, everyone here in the top row would have been better than this. Or the second row. Or the third row. Or the, here is kind of a lousy one, yeah. Anyway, you gotta really, like, hunt to find a bad one, and somehow they did that. I was trying to put this in, like, bird terms for any bird people here in the chat. You know how, uh... Here. Um... Some of you might be surprised by this. But it's a... Uh... Oh, shoot. I'm trying to find a video of this here. Um... Uh, famously, the... Like, any time that you see... Oh, here we go. This is it. Yeah. Almost any time that you see a bald eagle or any kind of bird of prey in a movie, it's not making the proper sound for it. It's making a red-tailed hawk noise. Check it out. Red-tailed hawks live throughout North and Central America, and even if you don't live anywhere near their native range, they're probably familiar to you. We'll explain why in just a bit. Mm. Red-tailed hawk. Let's fast forward to that bit there. Um... Mm-hmm. Here we go. And have little white U or V shapes on the edges of their feathers, yeah. which can be seen while the wings are folded up and the bird is perched. Even if you've never seen one of these beauties, we can almost guarantee you've heard one. Probably yep. the easiest way to tell there's a red-tailed hawk in the area is to listen for its call. Does yep. this sound familiar? We'd be You've heard that a million times before, right, chat? Here. To listen for its call. Does this sound familiar? We'd be... That's a red-tailed hawk call. I'm building to an analogy here. This is all going somewhere. I'm not jumping around for no reason. Surprised if you haven't heard that or something similar, because that's the sound filmmakers use as sound clips for raptors in film, regardless yep. of the species. Yep. Female red-tailed hawks are So anyway, almost any time that you see a bald eagle in a movie, they give it that noise, and that's the noise of a red-tailed hawk. And bird people, people who are passionate about birds, you know, they're uh it drives them nuts, and it kind of drives me nuts too. It's like 
I don't know. And if you're watching this and you go, well, that's not, that's not a big deal. Why do they get so upset about that? Think about something that you're passionate about. Whether it's... Oh, shoot. I don't know. Uh... Sports cars. Or baseball. Or... Uh, celebrity gossip or something like that. Think if, like, every time in a movie that thing showed up, they got it wrong. It would take you out of the film. It would it would ruin your immersion. It'd be like, why not just get it right? You know, it, it's just as easy to get it right as it is to get it wrong. It's like you went out of your way to get it wrong. W what's up with that? It's kind of the same deal as here. Where... You know, this is supposed to be a Tyrannosaurus skull, and it just looks off. It looks wrong. They use, like, a weird sculpt or something here for a T-Rex skull. This would be like having a red-tailed hawk in your movie, and then it doesn't make the red-tailed hawk noise. It's like somebody just screams into a microphone, and that's supposed to be the noise for the red-tailed hawk. It's like you use a red-tailed hawk scream for every other bird of prey. But then when you actually show a red-tailed hawk, it's just like a child screaming into a microphone or something. It's kind of like this. Everybody knows what Tyrannosaurus' skull looks like. It is a super, super common dinosaur. Like, it's not difficult to find images of its skull at all. And here they just use like a weird sculpt or something. What? What? Oh, boy. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, uh, and Lenina, so Lenina knows, Lenina says, when people see me knitting and ask if I'm crocheting, it's not great every time. Yeah, Lenina, there you go. Shoot, I gotta be sure not to make that mistake. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Dilbot says people referring to clone troopers as stormtroopers. There you go. Yeah, that was before the Empire, Dilbot. See, I know that. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Neon Coffee Cat just says, just smile and wave, Danny. Just smile and wave. No, Neon Coffee Cat. I will not. Tarquin says people mixing up the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. It's a bit people of mine. There you go, Tarquin. Yeah. Or thinking Julius Caesar was an emperor. Well, he was Caesar. Yeah, he wasn't an emperor, right? Anyway. Um. Yeah. Do you want to know what a bald eagle actually sounds like? Uh. Before we move on with our dinosaur video. Here we go. So, red-tailed hawk versus bald eagle. That's a red-tailed hawk. This is what a bald eagle sounds like. It's kind of a chittery kind of call. So yeah, yeah. Sorry if that's too loud. Yeah. Anyway, now, now you know. Hopefully you'll never make that mistake. And you'll be, in this regard, smarter than every filmmaker, uh, Foley artist, director, whatever, out there. You know? Producer. Uh. Anyway. So yeah, this is garbage. Ugh sharp teeth up to six inches in length that's also not a tyrannosaurus tooth. oh boy that's a carcarodontosaur dinosaur tooth it was a formidable adversary for any oh creature boy. It came across the discovery journey of the tyrannosaurus and again is it uh they're using like a weird sculpt here rather than a it's not difficult to get footage of an actual skull uh the 19th century and the first remains of this mighty predator were discovered in the western United States. This discovery was a milestone in paleontology, 
And as it was That's not a tyrannosaur there. The largest dinosaurs to have ever been discovered This at is the not time. a tyrannosaur. The first specimen discovered was on display uh, at the American Museum of Natural History. There's so much footage of the AMNH T-Rex. Why would you have to show this? You could even literally just show the logo for Jurassic Park and that is the AMNH Tyrannosaurus there. That's AMNH 5027. Right? Uh, or maybe that's the Carnegie Museum. Anyway, history. This is wrong. The T-Rex uh, had powerful jaws with a bite force. And this is Allosaurus. Oh my goodness, this is not even the right dinosaur. <laughs> It's Allosaurus from the Jurassic, not Tyrannosaurus from the end of the Cretaceous. This is, oh my goodness. Really, really trying my patience here. Uh, uh, of over 12,800 pounds. Make and Neon Coffee Cat says, would commenting on this help? Is there a way to get rid of this? I mean, I... I guess you could like thumbs down the video, but there's already actually a fair number of thumbs downs on this. I'm going to thumbs down it too. Um, yeah. And anyway, I guess we could look at the comments. We're going to break that rule. Never look at the comments. We're going to look at the comments. Uh, here's somebody pointing out that there, we haven't even gotten to Giganotosaurus yet, but talking about how their Giganotosaurus is wrong. Uh, but yeah, most of this stuff is just people saying, oh yeah, this is great, I love this. Although this person says, that's an Allosaurus you showed when talking about the T-Rex. That's exactly what we're looking at right here. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. Oh, this person says, I feel like this man should be telling me about creationism. He'd probably get less stuff wrong. <laughs> so there is, there are some people in the comments who recognize that most of this stuff is garbage, but... Uh, anyway. Yeah, feel free to just comment on the video, I guess, if if you feel like it. Um... But I don't know. It's sometimes it's just best to ignore this sort of thing too, because even a comment there is, uh, you know, that's going to increase engagement for the video. That's going to raise its profile a bit. Maybe just ignore it. Maybe this is honestly the best way of doing this. Like me just talking about this video to an audience, so it's getting exactly one view and one thumbs down but we're still getting good information out there. You know, we're using this as a springboard for discussion about real information on dinosaurs, you know? So yeah, yeah, this is amateur documentary. This is a professionally produced video, it seems like. It's just very, very low quality. Like they they did not do their due diligence here. It's It's just dog water quality. But I'm pretty sure that this channel here is, you know... I'm pretty sure it's like a company that put this together. Um, it's like professionally produced. It's just very poorly done. So I don't know if it's... An, I think it's professional. I don't think it's amateur, MacGyver. But I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. And I would agree with Mayor of Space here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mayor of Space says, I don't think we need to try and do anything. About the video. There's a million gazillion bad videos on the internet. Very true. We just have to point people to good videos and good information. And that's kind of what I'm trying to produce right here, Mayor Space, you know? We're taking this slop. Trying to turn it into science outreach in a positive way, you know? So yeah. Yeah. That's why I gotta focus on trying not to be overly negative about it. So there you go, Mayor Space. Yeah. And Neon Coffee Cat says, less effort for more views seems the way things are. Yeah. It's only going to increase when uh, all this, like, you know, AI garbage continues to get churned out. Because then you're going to have, like, AI stuff, which is producing scripts for videos that's... And it's, it's taking information from the internet, but that information was also created by AIs. 
And so it's like taking a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Things will just get degraded and degraded and degraded until, like, practically nothing that you read on the internet will be reliable anymore. It's, like, it's a really scary prospect, actually. AI is... could prove to be, like, the death of good information on the internet. Um... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Don't... don't get me started on that. Uh... But yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like a random group of astronomers. I don't think those people are actually astronomers, Jody Fish. I think... I think this is just like... I don't know. This is like a social media company or something like that that produced this. Uh... If it were... If there were actual astronomers here, they'd be talking about it. They'd be saying, hey... They'd say, hey, we're a group of astronomers, and this is our mission. This is just, like, some random garbage social media company. You know? Yeah. And if their video on dinosaurs is this bad, I betcha their astronomy stuff is also probably really bad, too. Like, let's take a look at... Uh... Here, let's take a look at the comments on this video, on images of Pluto. Um... Oh boy. And these are mostly positive. Um... Well, maybe their information on, sci on space is better, I don't know. Um... person says most of what you said is not true <laughs> I also do not like before scene pictures uh... anyway yeah Ugh. this is why I'm doing this live too rather than like producing a video about this kind of thing because I'm not trying to necessarily bring extra attention to this video it's just a nice way of, you know, this is a nice springboard for discussion about paleontological information. And this is a nice discussion to have live, too. You know, about the importance of having good information. And, like, how do we avoid this kind of garbage in the future, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And, uh, Walt R. Buck. How are you doing, Walter Buck? Welcome back. Good to see you. Walt says the level of AI danger is a rabbit hole of rabbit holes within rabbit holes. Wrong and or misinformation. There you go, Walter Buck. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Anyway. So let's continue this video. Again, this is not Tyrant. That's Allosaurus that they have right here. Again, just garbage. Garbage. Oh, well, the bite force of over 12,800 pounds making it one of the strongest animal bites ever recorded. It's assumed that a T-Rex was also a fast runner. Catching up to its prey, the T-Rex could reach speeds of up to 20 miles per hour. <laughs> just, just the most basic of errors here. Just incredibly sloppy. I say 20 miles per hour, and then, <laughs> and then it says 20 kilometers per hour. Like, which is it? We don't... I don't know. Don't get me started on the speed of Tyrannosaurus and everything else. I don't know. You can't have a, a discussion about this without talking about ontogeny in these animals. But, uh, yeah. Professor Blunt, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Pray. The T -Rex ontogeny. The speeds of up to 20 miles per hour. Ontogeny. 20 miles per hour, and then KPH is up here. Anyway. Triceratops in turn. Oh boy. I'll put the question to you, chat. What's wrong with this image? It was one of the few. Oh no. <laughs> See, Bet Medler, you see what I'm talking about? 
These are not... I'm not nitpicking here. It really is just... Completely wrong. This is garbage. Uh... So obviously, this is not Triceratops. It's not even like they showed another Chasmosaurine Ceratopsian, like, oh, a Rhinoceratops or Pentaceratops. Professor Blunt, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Hope you stick around. Let me know if you got any questions. It's the, it's the dinosaur man! Sefi? This stream is making my night. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Sefi, for the three months of primes there. Sefi, I appreciate that tremendously. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. That's excellent. I really appreciate your ongoing support, Sefi. You're the reason that I can continue to do this, along with other recurring subscribers. I, this would not be possible were it not for your continued support, so thank you very, very much. Holy cow. Um, so yeah, yeah, this is obviously not Triceratops. This is Pachyrhinosaurus. This is like an entirely different genus. It's from a different family of horned dinosaurs. This is from... Whoop, hang on a second. We've got some gift subs from Sefi, and I'm sure our, our new upgraded Tinamu bird can handle this, right? Very excited about those subs, and, um... Oh, uh-oh. Get out of there, it's gonna blow! Shoot! Sefi 314 is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. <laughs> Sefi, thank you, thank you for that. Holy cow. Ten give subs from Sefi. Sefi, I appreciate you more than you know. Thank you very, very much for that. And I'm sure everybody who just received a give sub from you appreciates it just as much. Now they won't have to watch ads for the next 30 days. And they'll get all those emotes too. You know, like these and these and these and etc. So thank you, Sefi. I, uh, I really appreciate that. And that Tinamu, that he'll be, he'll be fine. There, uh, Player Burr, no, no worries. <laughs> A mighty bird indeed, Freelancer, yes. Yeah. Uh, this has been a day. Alrex Gaming, it's great to see ya. Well, if it's been a day from seeing that one, shoot. Look at this. Oh, boy. So this is a Pachyrhinosaurus. Nowhere close to Triceratops. Pachyrhinosaurus. It's not even a Chasmosaurian. You know, if they'd shown... If they'd shown, like, um... I don't know. Pentaceratops or something. Then I'd be like, okay, I can understand how you'd make that mistake. You know? Or like, uh... A rhinoceratops, perhaps. I could see how, on a bad day, you could call this triceratops. You know. Um. Yeah. I mean, look at look at this one. I could see that. I could see that for sure. But, Achyrhinosaurus? Like really? A hornless ceratops. It's got that big nasal boss on it. This is very, very clearly not Triceratops. I mean... It's right there in the name, people. Triceratops, three-horned face. You know? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for raising my spirits a bit, Sefi, with those ten gift subs. I really appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. But now we've got to continue on with this garbage video. Oh, boy. And we're n oh. we're five and a half minutes into the video. We're at, our timestamp says five thirty six. This is a thirty one minute long video. Oh no! Six 
distinction is no shame, no sign of disgrace or failure. Yeah, you know. Fact in a world full of changing environments and occasional catastrophe, all species eventually become extinct. Maybe I should just go extinct, Ali J. Appreciate you, Danny. I appreciate you, Ali J. Thank you, thank you for the seven months of support. Seriously, really appreciate that, Ali J. Thank you, thank you for helping make all this possible with your continued support. It really does mean a lot to me. Um, with sincere yeah. appreciation and gratitude, thank you very much for the 100 bits. And MacGyver. You can do it, soldier. You know what? You're right, MacGyver. Thank you. Let's let's climb back into the trenches here and uh. Oh boy. You know, I've I've worked on triceratops before. I've dug up a whole bunch of triceratops and uh you know, I know triceratops and this is no triceratops. This this part's going to be painful. So You know? Hold on to your butts. Let's press play. Creatures that could stand up to the mighty Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, Triceratops was a large herbivorous dinosaur that looks somewhat like a modern rhinoceros. Not really, but whatever. Another terrible Triceratops, by the way. Oh, man. it You could have easily gotten footage of Triceratops from, like, the Saurian game or something, and that's exquisite. I would have been so happy about that, you know? But they don't know what they're doing. They're just taking these garbage images from left and right. They reach you know? up to 29 feet in length and weighed up to 12 tons. 12 tons is probably too heavy, but yeah. Um, and Rodan, I don't know, Rodan. Mm. Triceratops had a massive head with its skull making up a third of its entire body. It also had a bone frill around its head this frill was made of carotene and blood vessels similar to <laughs> it was made of keratin and blood vessels yeah was certainly not bone oh gratitude. boy thank you very much for the 100 bits and thank you golganak 157 super major paleocera body paleocera oh golganak so that that reminds me i uh i really want to do a paleo salute emote and uh Anyway, one of these days I'll I'll take the time to do that. I think that would I would use that a lot. But um would you like that, Claire Burr? Would anybody else like a, a paleo salute emote? I think uh, I use other salute emotes all the time. I think that would be really nice. But uh Yeah, yeah. Uh can send you a clip. Please do, Claire Burr. Yeah, whisper it to me. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Uh there's the Claire the uh, Ios salute and Delta salute. Uh, here we go. Oh, do I not have that anymore? Oh, shoot. Anyway, yeah. Paleo thumbs up. We already have yes, roses and tea, but I'll, I'll take that under advisement. Thumbs up might be useful as well. Oh, yeah. Anyway, one of these days we'll do that. But yeah, this is the hatcher specimen of Triceratops. Uh, this is Triceratops hordus, I think. Well, actually, its horns are looking kind of processy. But anyway, this is from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. You can actually see this today underneath a Tyrannosaurus having its head pulled off by the Wonkle Rex. But anyway, yeah. This frill was made of carotene and blood vessels. <laughs> made of carotene and blood vessels, similar to feathers. Wait, what? Um, didn't Prorsus have fenestrae? Only, well, probably not as early in ontogeny as Horridus did, Jody Fish. Yeah, it would have to be like a super mature Triceratops Prorsus to have fenestrae. Um, yeah. And Lenina th says, I think that's the one my trike skull necklace is based on. It probably is. This is one of the most famous Triceratops skulls in the world. Um, this one here is uh, a specimen nicknamed Hatcher, after John Bell Hatcher. There we go. I've searched for this before. The Hatcher Triceratops specimen. There you go. This one, I think, actually has, like, Hadrosaur back legs. 
Or hadrosaur feet, maybe? The hind feet? Um, this is before it was corrected. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a hadrosaur foot there on the back. It looks very hadrosaur to me. Anyway, they're just mixing and matching parts from a different dinosaur there. But yeah, this is what it used to look like at the Smithsonian. Nowadays, it's underneath a T-Rex having its head pulled off. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, there we go. Good stuff. So yeah. Frill around his head. This frill was made of carotene. And Wait, and Professor Blunt says, what are those ribs near the rear legs? Wait, what do you mean? Um... Oh, no, those are the ischia. The hip bones on the back. Yeah, here, let me show you. Here's a lovely skeletal diagram by the very talented Scott Hartman there. And so... These in the back, this is the hips, so that's the femur, the thigh bone, that's where it fits into the hip socket. And then you've got the ilium up top, the pubis in front, and the ischium in back. These are paired bones. So here you're seeing both of the ischia coming down and, and joining. They, they basically kind of come down like this, and then they join in the center. Right there. Does that make sense? Yeah, those are hip bones. We have the same hip bones in our hips, but ours are shaped a lot differently. Um, one of these days, I'd love to do a, uh, a YouTube video about homology. But we'll see. Yeah. Like the bone on a chicken. Uh, kind of, yeah, chickens also have the same bones, but they look a little, di they look a lot different. Here. Um... A chicken pelvis. There we go. So the... Yeah. And the chicken, the ilium and the pubis and the ischium were all kind of fused together. But yeah. There it is right there. There's the ilium part of the pelvis of a chicken. Right there. Which... Can you kind of see the similarity? See kind of what's going on there? Yeah. The one that looks like a V, Prof Professor Blunt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that makes sense. Thanks for thanks for asking about that. Yeah. See, that's what that's what makes these streams fun. This, you know, live give and take like this. You've got questions, I've got answers, you know. If you're feeling a bit cheated, try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you Lilith Hobo for those 100 bits. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good stuff. Mm. So anyway. Yeah. Triceratops. What was this explanation about the frill? Oh no. It also had a bone frill around his head. This frill was made of carotene and blood vessels similar to... So it wasn't... So the frill itself is bone here. But it would have been covered with keratin that was supplied by blood vessels. So that's... Even if it's not incorrect, they worded it really badly to make it really confusing. Oh, boy. Yeah. Keratin, not carotene. Yes. Keratin is the same material that our fingernails or our hair is made from. Similar to the feathers of a modern bird. Uh, a little bit different. That like the birds, Triceratops may have been sporting vibrant colors. Yes, I agree about that. Yeah. Played yeah. An important role in socializing, as well as demonstrating the specimen's strength or signaling dominance to potential mates or rivals. Sure. Fossilized skulls of Triceratops have oh, been repeatedly no, found one. with abrasions and dents, indicating confrontation with rivals. Uh, this is like, isn't this a fish tank? Um, this looks like those fish tank ornaments that you could buy at, at Petco. I, I legitimately think that's what this is right here. Oh, boy. Including predators and fellow Triceratops in the battle for territory or partners. Mm. One such specimen even had a broken horn and tooth marks, and they could be mad. We've got lots of Triceratops with tooth marks. Holy cow. There's a... Uh, yeah. 
I mean, it, it rankles me that they're, they're like, oh, one such specimen even had tooth marks. And this is one that was auctioned off in Paris last year for way too much money. Just ridiculous. Trying to, like, commercialize dinosaur science. Sell specimens to the highest bidders. Very much opposed to that. But actual scientific research done on dinosaurs, like, uh... Like Denver Fowler. My old crew chief. did a really cool study on Triceratops looking at <sighs> excuse me looking at all these different specimens at Museum of the Rockies and looking for uh, for tooth marks on them to basically try and find patterns for like you know if we consistently find tooth marks in the same place in the same orientation shows us kind of a pattern this is probably how T-Rex was eating Triceratops. You know? Uh, very cool stuff. Yeah. Denver Fowler, Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana, and his colleagues studied numerous Triceratops specimens from Montana's Hell Creek Formation to identify how many had the characteristic tooth marks of Tyrannosaurus on them. They found 18 specimens. That's just at Museum of the Rockies. 18 trikes with T-Rex tooth marks on them. Uh, when they looked closer, they noticed something important. None of the bones showed any signs of healing, indicating that the bites were inflicted on dead animals that were in the process of being eaten. Yeah. Uh, very cool. So anyway. Uh, Denver said, It's gruesome, but the easiest way to, to eat a Triceratops was to pull the head off, explains Fowler with a grin. The researchers found evidence to support this idea when they examined the Triceratops' occipital condyles. It's like the, the ball and socket connector joint between the head and the neck. Uh, and found tooth marks on there, too. Such marks could only have been made if the animal had been decapitated. So anyway, really, really cool stuff. I'll give you the link to this. How to eat a Triceratops. Fascinating stuff. And it was Tyrannosaurus eating Triceratops, Green Panthera. Yes, indeed, the, the bite marks match that of D-Rex. And those are just at Museum of the Rockies, Golkanek, yeah. 18 different Triceratops with T-Rex bite marks just at that one museum. Think about all the museums around the world that have Triceratops specimens from Montana, from Wyoming, from North and South Dakota, and Colorado. So, yeah. Uh, how to serve ma- I mean, trike. There you go, Walter Buck. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cookbook. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Yeah, since that frill would protect the neck at least a little bit from bites, uh, Professor Blunt, you'd have to pull the head off in order to, uh... In order to get to the, uh, the neck meat underneath. Yeah. There we go. Uh, my friend Nate Carroll actually did the illustrations for this. Denver wanted really simple illustrations. You know, just like a schematic, basically. Like something you could see in a, in a set of Ikea instructions. You know? Here's how you can put together your Norfolk's Brawl coffee table. Or here's how you can eat your Triceratops as a T-Rex. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, how to disassemble your trike. There you go, Lenina. Yes, indeed. So anyway, there are, I guess, maybe were some bite marks here, but it, this was never really properly published on because this was a commercial specimen. They dug this thing up only to sell it. This wasn't done for science. It was done for, you know, to try and make a huge profit. And unfortunately, they did make a huge profit. It's bad news for our science, but... ...matched to a Tyrannosaurus rex bite. Yeah. However, fossil studies have shown that the dinosaur itself died of natural causes. This shows that with its three horns... Yeah, we don't know that. bony frill, the Triceratops uh. was a formidable opponent for any predator. At the same time, a heavily armored Ankylosaurus... 
Uh, at least it is Ankylosaurus that they're showing here. This is such a garbage one. You want to see a good Ankylosaurus? I'll show you a beautiful one. But, uh, yeah, this. Basura. Afuera. The maybe the best reproduction of Ankylosaurus that I know of is here. It's actually from the game Saurian. It's beautiful. I love the coloration. The armor like pattern is actually based on real fossil evidence. And Victoria Arbor, who published a paper on uh, you know, like revising Ankylosaurus and its armor pattern, she'd be really proud of this. She may have helped consult on this. I don't know, but. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, really, really good stuff. This is a beautiful Ankylosaurus here. And I wonder if, you know, we might be playing this game tomorrow, actually. I think I have that on the schedule. Uh, um, do we have footage of this animal? Uh, it's so dark, you really can't see it. Uh, that's unfortunate. Anyway, such a, a beautiful representation of this animal. Oh, here we've got a, I guess in the Saurian game, this person's playing as Triceratops. Man, their graphics card is really struggling here. But there's a big ol' honkin' male Triceratops. And they're gonna go try and fight this Ankylosaurus here. Yeah. Anyway, that Triceratops is, like, bigger than an elephant. That's This is a huge animal. Ankylosaurus is pretty darn big, too. One of the biggest of the Ankylosaurus. Yeah. A video game stream? I think so, Lenina. We'll see if I can get the green screen to work. Yeah. Uh. With yeah. sincere appreciation and gratitude, thank you very much for the 100 bits. A point W H O A for your new graphics card, Ja. Oh, Lilithub, I appreciate that. I don't need a new graphics card. This whoever posted this video did. Um. But I appreciate that, Lilithobo. I will put that maybe toward the generator fund that we'll need for this summer. Uh, maybe this weekend? Uh, yeah, Lenina, go for it. That sounds cool. And Walter Buck says, did herbivores ever fight over resource feeding so grounds? Sure. Oh, Appreciate definitely. I'm sure, gratitude. yeah. Thank you very much for the 100 bits. View a Saurian night with Danny? Uh, Sefi, well, shoot, tomorrow on stream, I think I'm going to be playing Storian. We'll see. Anyway, here's this person... Trying to fight an Ankylosaurus as Triceratops. Why? Leave him alone. Anyway. Uh, what a wonderful representation of this dinosaur. This is one of the best reconstructions I have ever seen of, uh, of Ankylosaurus. Just really, really beautiful. This is garbage by comparison. Yeah. Roamed the land on the territory of the modern <laughs> USA and Canada. It reached 29 feet in length and a weight oh, of garbage. about seven tons. What? Ankylosaurus is. Uh, what was that? 29 feet in length. Uh, completely. Oh, uh, just. I don't even know what to say. Garbage. A weight of about seven tons. That's the Ark Ankylosaur? Oh, boy. I'm sorry, but the Ark Ankylosaurus? Dog water. Just terrible. Really, really bad. Really bad. Of about seven tons. Oh, no. Ankylosaurus is also known for its... So here it is. This is what it looked like in Jurassic Park 3, which wasn't great for the time, but it wasn't terrible. Nowadays, you know, we've got much better information on what these animals look like. Uh, yeah. 
we go. Here's the image I was looking for. Yeah. So this is from Ankylosaur researcher Victoria Arbor on her paper, Revising Ankylosaurus. So back when Barnum Brown first found the critter back in 1908. Shoot, he didn't even know that it had a tail club. See? Uh, but then, uh, yeah, Tracy Ford's paper from 2003. Kind of revising the critter further. Basically looking at new material of Ankylosaurus that was dug up, and then material from closely related Ankylosaurs. With dinosaurs, we rarely find a complete skeleton of any kind of dinosaur. And so we use their very close relatives to help fill in the gaps. To help figure out, you know, make educated guesses on what the rest of the animal would look like, even though we might be missing that part of the skeleton. So here's what they were doing there. Uh, Ken Carpenter in 2004 reconstructed it like this. But this is our most up-to-date reconstruction of Ankylosaurus that I know of. And that's the one that the Saurian game draws from here. So yeah. Yeah. Neon Coffee Cat. Della. I don't know what that is, Neon Coffee Cat. Yeah. Uh, looks like pineapple, says Green Panthera. I mean, it's a, a similarly dangerous... Although I'd argue that a, an ankylosaur would be a lot more dangerous than a pineapple. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It's just yeah. Like the body armor, which includes thick... This is not great. ...plates and a club-shaped tail. This armor made the ankylosaurus virtually invulnerable to predator attacks. Oh, boy. And I think these are sauropeltic, because that's Acrocanthosaurus, right? There you go, Lenina. Lenina, you watching right now? Are you feeding the cats? Yeah, there's your dinosaur right there, Lenina. Um, yeah, this is Sauropelta. This is not Ankylosaurus. Completely different dinosaur. Lived tens of millions of years before Ankylosaurus. Ugh. Yeah. In particular, the club-shaped tail was one of its most striking features. Formed from several large fused bones, it created a bone mass at the end <laughs> oh, of the tail no. that weighed That's several so bad. pounds. This mass uh, was used as a defense against predators that can be swung with great force. And then they show an ankylosaur that doesn't have a tail club. The attacker. This uh, unique adaptation, along with its armor, allowed the ankylosaurus to survive in an environment where predators constantly hunted for food. Another unique inhabitant of North America was the Pachycephalosaurus. I don't know if I'd say that Pachycephalosaurus was unique. I mean, we've got other Pachycephalosaurus from around the world. Unique means there's nothing else like it. Unique is a superlative word. It, you know, if something can't be very unique. It just, it is unique or it's not. Unique is, if you say something is unique, that's a strong claim. You know? Sefi says, but he has a I'm funny head. Me. Well, yeah, but there's a lot of other Pachycephalosaurus that got funny heads too. You know? Stegosaurus leaps to mind. You know, Stegosaurus. Um, another Pachycephalosaur, another member of the same family. Um, you know, uh, Prenocephaly. There we go. Prenocephaly. So Pachycephalosaurus, I wouldn't call it unique, you know? It's... It's got a lot of relatives. That's how we actually know what Pachycephalosaurus would look like. Because I don't think anybody's found a complete skeleton. But we do have more or less complete skeletons of this relative Prenocephaly. So yeah. Again, this is not Pachycephalosaurus. This is Prenocephaly. So with, with most dinosaurs, I don't know. If a dinosaur is unique, that probably means we don't really know what it looks like. Um, there are some unique dinosaurs out there, and we don't really know what the whole body looked like. I'm looking at you like Jaco Peel from South America, or, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Critters like that. Um... 
Maybe uh, uh, Spicomelis from uh, North Africa. Another example of a unique dinosaur. And because it's unique, we only have a few pieces of it. We don't know what the heck it looked like. Um, yeah. In order to actually have a decent picture of what uh, what any kind of dinosaur looked like, it has to be non-unique. It has to have close relatives. The, you know, we've got evidence for what they looked like. That's the deal with Pachycephalosaurus, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. In 1943, a paleontologist named Barnum Brown made the groundbreaking discovery of a skull in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana. The dinosaur reached 15 feet in length. And <laughs> uh, this, they didn't intend to get this right. They got this accidentally right, which is really funny to me. <laughs> ah, who, who, oh shoot, who in chat? Gianni says, that's Stitchy Moloch. Well, you know, yeah, there you go. Yeah, you got it, Gianmi. Oh, shoot. That screwed up our timeline here. Um, there we go. Yeah. So, Stygimoloch and Pachycephalosaurus. Probably the same dinosaur. So, they, they like, made a mistake, but... It, they're really lucky for them. The mistake turned out to be, like, more or less true. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Here's from an old TED Talk. Yeah. With my old boss, Jack Horner, here. TEDx Vancouver. Here are 12 dinosaurs, and we want to look at these three first. So these are dinosaurs that yeah. are pachycephalosaurs. And this is not an allosaurus. There you go, Green Panther, yeah. These were related. Yep. And the assumption is, is that they're related, you know, like cousins or whatever. But yeah. no one ever considered that they might be more closely related. Yeah, let me know. Yeah, Ichi is pretty people unique. looked at them, yeah. and they saw the differences. And you all know that if you are going to determine whether you're related to your brother or your sister, you can't do it by looking at differences, right? You can only determine relatedness by looking for similarities. So people were looking at these and they were talking about how different they are. Yep. Pachycephalosaurus has a big, big thick dome on its head and it's got some little bumps on the backs of its head. And it's got a bunch of gnarly things on the front of its nose. Yep. And then Stygimoloch, another dinosaur, from the same age, lived at the same time, has spikes sticking out the back of its head. It's got mm -hmm. a little tiny dome, and it's got a bunch of gnarly stuff on its nose. And then there's this thing called Draco Rex, Hogwarts Eye. Guess where that came from? Dragon. So here's a dinosaur that has spikes sticking out of its head, no dome, and gnarly stuff on its nose. Look how different Nobody these are. The gnarly stuff sort of looked alike, but but they very much alike. These three, and they said these are three Identical. different dinosaurs, and Draco Rex is probably the most primitive of them, and the other one is more primitive than the other. I, it's unclear to me how they actually sorted these three of them out. But yeah. if you line them up, if you just take those three skulls and just line them up, they line up like this. Draco yep. Rex is the littlest one. Stygimoloch is the middle-sized one. Pachycephalosaurus is the largest one. And one would think, that should give me a clue. Ontogeny. <laughs> but it didn't give him a clue. <laughs> because, well, we know why. Scientists like to name things. Yeah. So, if we cut open Draco Rex, I cut open our Draco Rex. And look at it, it was spongy inside. Really spongy inside. I mean, it is a juvenile, and it's growing really fast. Yep. So it is going to get bigger. If you cut open Stygimoloch, it is doing the same thing. The dome, the dome, that little dome is growing really fast. It's inflating very fast. What's interesting is the spike on the back of the Draco Rex was growing very fast as well. But the then it's resorbing. The back of the Stygimoloch are actually resorbing. Getting smaller. Getting smaller. Yeah. 
as that dome is getting bigger. And if we look at Pachycephalosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus has a solid dome and its little bumps on the back of its head were also resorbing. So yep. just with these three dinosaurs, you can easily, you know, as a scientist, we can easily hypothesize that it is just a growth series. It's the same, the same critter. Animal. Yeah. Which, of course, ontogeny means that Stygimoloch and Dracorex are extinct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Which, of course, means we have 10 primary dinosaurs to deal with. Yeah. And uh, Gianni says, is this widely approved by paleontologists? Widely accepted? Yeah. For the most part, yeah. There's still a few dinosaur paleontologists who would argue that, like, oh, no, Draco Rex, definitely, definitely different. But... You know, out of all of these synonymizations that happen throughout this this TED talk here, you know, we get to the very end and uh yeah. therefore we could take So in Cretaceous we have seven left. Yep. So not every dinosaur paleontologist agrees with all of these, but the one that's the least controversial is probably uh Stygimoloch and Draco Rex being synonymous with Pachycephalosaurus. Pachycephalosaurus is probably the least controversial out of all of these. Um, yeah, uh, least controversial among paleontologists, I should say. I'll, I'll let Jack talk about this. And that's a good number. I mean, that, that's a good number to go extinct, I think. Now, as you can imagine, this is not very popular with fourth graders. No. Fourth graders <laughs> love their dinosaurs. They memorize them. And, uh. And they're not, they're not happy with this. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Anyway. Um, so this is, when we talk about ontogeny, this is what we're referring to. You know? Uh, the growth and development of a, an animal, in this case a dinosaur, over its individual lifespan. Ontogeny. So this is one dinosaur growing up from a baby to an adult. Ontogeny are the growth, growth and changes that happen ontogeny. during its lifetime. That's what ontogeny means. So uh, it turns out a lot of dinosaurs changed tremendously to the point where we used to think that they were different genera or species entirely. But nowadays we realize that... Yeah, Stygimoloch seems to be the same critter as Pachycephalosaurus. And that, you know, there might be something kind of interesting and wonky going on with heterochrony here, like Pachycephalosaurus not just changing through its individual lifespans as these animals are living and dying, but also like as the critters are evolving over the course of the Hell Creek Formation, evolving over two million years, the way that they change through their lifespans is also changing. So it might get kind of complicated, and you know, we might not have like mature, full domed Pachycephalosaurus by the time you get to the top of the Hell Creek. But that's a discussion for another time. So anyway, about 990 yeah. pounds. Its Latin name meaning fat headed lizard refers to its most distinct fat headed lizard. I mean, I guess that's not wrong, but Pecky means thick, thick headed lizard. Fat headed, li uh, I don't know. It's not wrong. It's just like, yeah, I don't know. Active feature. A yeah. thick dome skull up to about six inches thick, which was yeah. used for butting its head. Probably not. Probably not used for butting its head. Oh, boy. Um, Jordi Fesch says, think how much a patagotitan has to change from fitting inside the egg to a full-grown adult as big as a jetliner. Yeah, there you go, Jordi Fesch. Holy cow. Yeah. And, uh... Oh, and very cool. Jack visited your university there for Darwin Day, Golganek? Many years ago. Very, very cool, Golgonek. That's awesome. Oh, I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. Uh, and Anandusha says, I had one professor who was working on the frogs of Borneo. Very cool. Trying to see if the described species based on larvae could be matched with species based on adults to reduce the numbers of species. And usually the papers he wrote, which he reduced the number of species 
published much worse than the ones described in this. Yeah, there you go, on Andusha, yeah. A lot of journals would just outright reject that kind of thing. It's like, it's a problem in the sciences is that null results are more difficult to get published. You know, it's less flashy. But yeah. And Nell says, calling Pachycephalosaurus fat-headed lizard. Six bits, most distinct. Uh, feels like Danny being called Daniel feels wrong and off. There you go, Nell. Agreed. Uh, and Anandusha says, I personally think it's really exciting and great science to show that two different ontogenetic stages aren't different the same species. Agreed, Anandusha. Agreed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A thick domed skull up to about six inches thick, which was used for butting its head. This behavior could be used for courtship or to resolve territorial dispute. Despite yeah. this feature, Pachycephalosaurus no. were generally peaceful creatures. Spending Man, I can't wait until we can have Kerry Woodruff tell us about these. Their time I wonder when that's actually going to be published or whether he could talk about it now. But a uh, friend of mine, Kerry Woodruff, who's now Dr. Kerry Woodruff, he got a job at a museum down in Florida. He did his PhD on Pachycephalosaurus, and he had a really complete specimen to look at that the Canadians purchased years ago. And, uh... Anyway, I think that's the case, anyhow. I think they purchased it. Ugh. Those Canadians coming down across the border and buying up our North America, our American dinosaurs. You know, funding the gray market in dinosaur fossils. Anyway, um, yeah, Kerry had, like, access to a more or less semi-complete skeleton of Pachycephalosaurus. Has some really interesting insights about it. It is not what you think it is. It's not behaving in the way you would expect it to. There's some really interesting stuff going on, and I can't wait until he finally gets that published and the whole world knows about Raising it. Raising in clearings you and know? avoiding conflict. Yeah. We usually think of dinosaurs as fearsome lizards, often huge in size. However, there were also very interesting species on Earth that had an atypical appearance. Let's fast forward to... That's not where I thought that sentence was going to go. Oh, no. Uh, you know, dinosaurs, we often think of them as big, fearsome lizards. Uh, however, and I thought he was going to say, a lot of dinosaurs were actually small, and dinosaurs are not lizards at all. They're much more closely related to birds. Birds themselves are living dinosaurs. He doesn't say that, though. Interesting species on Earth that had an atypical appearance. An atypical appearance. It's like, no, maybe the typical appearance of dinosaurs is not actually big and lizardy. Uh, this whole thing was written by an AI, wasn't it? Let's Ugh. fast forward to Laurasia, the yeah. second fragment of the once unified supercontinent Pangaea. In the dense primeval forest of the early Cretaceous period, there was a small feathered dinosaur known as Archaeopteryx. We talked about this already. Archaeopteryx is not from the Cretaceous period. Archaeopteryx is from the Jurassic. Oh, boy. And again, this is not me nitpicking. They, they specifically say Cretaceous. Here. Look. Supercontinent Pangaea. In the dense primeval forest of the early Cretaceous period. Again, early Cretaceous. Period. There was a small feathered dinosaur known as Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is from the Jurassic. Oh, boy. There you go, Jody Fish. 11 inches of classic Jurassic. There you go, Jody Fish. Uh, in Snowfall, why am I subjecting myself to this? I honestly didn't think it was going to be this bad. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, you know? So now we're just, we're just powering our way through. I'm not going to finish this video today. It is way too long. It's 31 minutes long. I'm not even 10 minutes into it. Um, yeah. Archaeopteryx was the size of a crow. It was one of the first birds to evolve from small feathered theropods. And it spent its days sure. hunting insects and small reptiles among the branches of the ancient trees. Okay. The discovery of Archaeopteryx dates That's a good back skeleton. to the late 1850s. Ooh. Or at least it's not terrible, terrible. I don't know what's up with the furcula there. The discovery. Yeah, that wishbone is not in the right place, but 
I'm like kind of impressed that that they yeah, where did they get this from? Theory of Archaeopteryx dates back to the late 1850s when a German farmer named Jacob Niemeyer discovered a fossilized feather in the huh. Solnofen limestone formation in Bavaria, Germany. Yeah. Over subsequent decades, more complete samples were found. The discovery of Archaeopteryx fish, yeah. was significant because it presented the scientific world with the first clear evidence of an evolutionary... So this is not Archaeopteryx here. This is like Patagopteryx or some... This is like some sort of an anti-ornithian bird, maybe? It's got a beak. Uh... Because it presented the scientific world with the first clear evidence of an evolutionary link between birds and dinosaurs. Sure, this unique that's true. combination of bird and reptile characteristics such as feathers and the wishbone challenge the conventional view of birds as a separate group of animals. Okay, yeah, Meanwhile, that much is true. On the different end of the same woods, there was a chase. Leptoceratops, a uh, cerat... No! Oh my goodness. Don't you bring my beautiful leptoceratops into this. Also, that's not a great leptoceratops, sir. <sighs> yeah. So, again, there is more time separating Archaeopteryx from leptoceratops than there is separating leptoceratops from us. Leptoceratops is closer in time to us in the present than it is to Archaeopteryx. Leptoceratops is from the end of the, of the, the Cretaceous period. It's from like the Hell Creek Formation of Montana and maybe the Scholard Formation of, of Canada. Um, uh, completely wrong. And this is a lousy Leptoceratops reconstruction, too. This is not good. Smorph draws a great Leptoceratops. This is true, Lenina. Let me pull that up. Smorphosaurus did a, a lovely Leptoceratops for us. Uh, for, uh, for the holidays. I saved that. Well, it'll be in my email at least. Um, let me pull it out of my email and save it in my Ben Art folder. There we go. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, Leptoceratops is one of my favorite dinosaurs because I got to work at a very cool Leptoceratops site uh, years and years ago. Um, and there we go from Smurf. Let's. Oh, that's why. Screen well, let me just show you. A beautiful Leptoceratops. See how Smorphosaurus is captured? Uh, how big the head is and how tall the tail is also. These guys have very tall neural spines on their tails. Um, yeah. That's... Uh, used a picture as a reference. Nice, Smorph. Yeah. Well, you did better than whoever made this. Gugh. Ugh. Yeah, yours is a million times better than that. Holy cow. Leptopsian dinosaur was being pursued by a predator. Leptoceratops oh, no. had a compact and agile... What is this? Uh, uh, garbage. This is terrible. This this might even supposed to be Yinlong instead of Leptoceratops. Anyway, terrible, agile terrible. Body, which was easily maneuvered, relying uh, on four legs. In Greek... Leptoceratops meant thin horn face. This animal had a sharp beak, a small frill on the back of the head, and a short horn on the nose. Yeah, that's really not a great... Anyway, yeah. It was about six and a half feet long and weighed approximately 330 pounds. Since this herbivorous dinosaur was relatively small, it could easily fall prey to other predators. Leptoceratops... To to other predators? Oh boy. ...was chased by the fast Sauronothoides. 
Hang on. Soronithoides is from the other side of the world, is it not? Or am I mixing up? Oh, shoot. There's three different dinosaurs here that are going to be very easy to mix up. There's Soronithoides, Sinornithoides, and Soronithalestes. So, Soronithalestes, Soronithoides, Sinornithoides. Um, that is to totally a Jurassic World Evolution model there, Claire Burr. I think Soronithoides is also from Mongolia, from like the Dejakta or Namekt formation. Yep. So lived on the other side of the planet than Leptoceratops. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. So this animal would have never met Leptoceratops. Lived at a different time and a different place. That's a lovely reconstruction of it here on Wikipedia. It's a zillion times better than whatever this garbage is. But, um... Yeah. Sauronithoides was a carnivorous dinosaur. It could reach up to 10 feet in length and up to 6.5 feet in height. Yeah, that sounds they way too big. They had an elongated skull, which was compressed vertically. They're actually showing a, a real photo of the actual skull, which is nice. It's a change of pace there. <laughs> they also had a relatively large brain and sharp. Uh, and this, I think, is supposed to be a velociraptor skull here. So, again, wrong animal. And Asteril at view. Hey, great to see you, too. I did have a good day. It's great to see you here. We're suffering through this video. We're not going to finish it today. It, oh, boy. But, um, yeah. Yeah. YouTube clickbait video about dinosaurs. And they're, it's roughly maybe 60-40 between bad information and information that's kind of okay. It's... Yeah, the bad information seems to be winning that battle, unfortunately. Teeth. A large, formidable uh. sickle-shaped claw on the second toe of each foot helped to grab its prey and most likely rip it open. With their deadly tool set, their victims stood almost no chance. Moving <laughs> further east as we travel through our... Soren, I thought he's his information. Oh, man, that's so funny. Uh. ...world we meet a variety of majestic creatures. These creatures once considered the vast expanse of Asia their home. From they, <laughs> I like how they put that. They once considered this their home. It's like, well, they're dinosaurs. They they live where they live. Like, oh, they 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 once considered this their home. Like, okay. I don't know. Towering uh, herbivores to the frightening it's starting predators. to take its toll. These leviathans had a myriad of adaptions that allowed them to thrive in their environment. I'm sorry, they had a what? Is he just mispronouncing, like, plain English words now? Did I... <laughs> myriad, yeah. It's myriad. Did he say myrad? Oh, oh boy. From towering herbivores to the frightening predators, these leviathans had a myriad of adaptions that... A myriad? Uh, a myriad of adaptions. Oh. It's adaptations, by the way. A myriad of adaptations. Uh... You know... I'm not going to give you the link to this. I don't I don't want people to to harass this channel in the comments or anything. That's not what I'm trying to do here. That's not what I'm trying to provoke. I guess if we can take one lesson from this, or maybe a couple of lessons from this. What did we learn today? We certainly didn't <laughs> didn't learn anything new and interesting about dinosaurs. Most of that information was garbage. Um there's a, some take-home lessons here. I think they are as follows. Number one. 
any information that you see in like a random YouTube video like that about dinosaurs very well might be incorrect. So don't trust it. All right, you know? Number two, the bar for like creating YouTube videos like this is really, really low. And they could have gotten just about all this stuff right if they just consulted somebody who knows a thing or two about dinosaurs. But, you know, emailed an undergraduate in paleontology at a university or something like that and say, hey, undergrad student, could you look over this script and, you know, Stevie could fix it for us? It would have been really, really simple. Um, yeah. I think another lesson is that media like YouTube don't necessarily incentivize actually getting things correct. You know? There's all these comments here about how what was it? It's like uh, this channel is going to get real big real quick. Great history teller and great vids. You know? Thumbs down. Sorry. Montreux. Um, <laughs> the statement rated false. I don't know. It, sometimes it seems like... Try blaming the dinosaurs. Oh, thank you, Golganak. I appreciate you, Golganak. Thank you for those hundred bits and for your kind words, Golganak. I appreciate you. Anyway, uh, be cautious about information that you find in places like YouTube and TikTok. Sometimes it seems like those are kind of equally cesspools of misinformation. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I... This is why I do what I do five days a week here on Twitch, you know? The whole reason that I devote so much time to outreach is because the world needs that. Very, very clearly. There's so much bad information out there that, and this is, you know, this isn't like a decidedly anti-science video. It's not like that. This is not some sort of creationist claptrap. This is not some sort of like flat earth or like dinosaur denier video where they're like, well, oh, dinosaurs are actually made up and the scientists buried those bones to fool us or whatever. This isn't even like that. Like, this is purporting to be, you know, a video that's excited about dinosaurs and eager to tell you cool things about them. I keep getting all these things wrong. We need more good science outreach in the world. We need more scientists actually talking to the general public and... trying to get good at doing that too because just being a scientist doesn't necessarily make you a good science communicator it takes work it takes practice it takes a lot of effort and thoughtfulness to be able to to produce good science outreach to be able to talk to people about science in a way that engages them and teaches them and gets them to care about what you're talking about and I'm still learning how to do that frankly you know I've been extremely lucky to be able to have this community here on Twitch, have this platform to be able to talk to people about fossils. And, you know, I'm trying to fight the good fight, I'm trying to get people excited about natural history, I'm trying to give them good information about dinosaurs in particular. So thank you everybody who helps me do that on a daily basis by subscribing and watching and everything else so yeah with that said here's our late Jurassic not Cretaceous bird Archaeopteryx we're going to run our credits over this and we're going to wrap up today's broadcast so how's that yeah uh anyway Ice Clop says it's high res bad information. There you go, Ice Clop, yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Anandusha says YouTube is more about entertainment than education. Isn't that true? 
That's true of all social media. And science is hard. Science communication as well. After all, you need to be good at sciencing and communicating. And Adusha, it's rare, a rare confluence of skills there. And I'm, I'm working hard to try and do that. But yeah. Anyway, I work hard every day, and hopefully, I'm getting through to some people. Thank you to everybody whose names are showing up here in the chat. I appreciate you more than you know. All of your ongoing support and your enthusiasm, your questions, your moderating moderators, I appreciate you. It's great to have you back, Claire Burr and Lenina. Mirror Space, wonderful to have you here. Thank you, everybody, for helping make this stream what it is, you know? Uh, we are going to go take a look, holy cow, at some modern dinosaurs here. Yeah. From Archaeopteryx here to some modern dinosaurs, some owls. They got some new cameras here at Hoot House live streams. Holy moly. We're going to look at some owls. There's cameras inside the next nest boxes. There's cameras outside. We'll be able to watch owls come back and forth, bringing food to their babies. This is really, really neat. You can even vote to name the hatchlings. This is going to be really cool. Anyway, everybody, thank you, thank you for another wonderful stream. I hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something. Thanks for sticking with me through those technical difficulties when OBS crashed. We are going to go say hello to some owls. Until next time, everybody, you take care of yourselves. I'll be streaming again tomorrow. Perhaps a video game stream? So catch me then at 2 p.m. California time on the morrow. <laughs> <laughs>